um, and we're going live now. That's that. Um, good evening, everyone. And on behalf of Team ISF, I welcome you all to day eight of India's largest virtual science festival. India Science Month Online, or ISMO 2021, is your one-stop destination for everything related to science and technology. Themed around space, health, and robotics, we want to celebrate science, and we are here to bring the voice of science to all of you. We have scientists, researchers, educators, teachers, students, and uh, science communicators coming together on our public engagement platform and collaborating to make science to make the scientific ecosystem more diverse and to bring science and society closer to each other. Before we begin with today's event, which is actually really exciting, I want to tell you all about. Uh, uh, our Twitter contest. So we have social media contests going on. So what you have to do is take a screen grab of the event that you're attending. Tell us what you like about it the most and put it up on Twitter. Tag us all over social media and we'll make sure that the best uh, tweet comes to attention and also wins exciting prizes. Now, um, the best part about our festival is that every event is free to attend. So we do encourage everybody um, you know, call your friends, call your family, um, tell everybody to be a part of this uh, wonderful event across the entire month. And, uh, you know, you can shoot in your questions, whatever they might be, through the course of the talks or the panel discussions. Um, and we'll make sure that our uh, speakers answer your doubts. And, um, and before we begin with today's talk, I would just like you all to please answer a quick poll that will be flashing on your screens right now so that we get to know a little more about all of this. So uh, with the poll results, I can see that we have maximum audience uh, from uh, colleges. So we have college students in majority here. Then we also have a couple of school students and we have a few faculty members joining us. So that tells us that, you know, it's, it's a good mix of uh, backgrounds that we have here. If you could just please answer the second poll for me, that would be great. So um, the poll results tell me that most of our attendees don't know much about the topic, but are curious to know more. Some have read about it a little and uh, you know, know a little bit about the topic. Some have studied this and wish to pursue it further. And um, some are working professionals in this field. So like I said before, I think we have a very interesting mix of audience members here. And um, like I said, uh, we have some really exciting events lined up for you all today. So it gives me great pleasure. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Van Zyl, all the way from South Africa, joining us to tell us about Africa's first nanosatellite that was launched into space. 
I'd just like to tell you all quickly over here that Professor Wanzel is the director of Africa Space Innovation Center associated with the French South African Institute of Technology. Professor Wanzel, thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today. And um, I just want you to know that apart from Zoom, we are also uh, posting our events on YouTube and Facebook. Our events are live on social media. So we'll also have questions coming in from there and I will be relaying them for you. So uh, without any further delay, over to you. Uh, good afternoon. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you. Um, I thank everybody across the world uh, watching um, and I hope that despite you know the pandemic and the difficulties we all face that you are all doing well but thank you for the interest that you're showing in science so um, I prepared a, a slideshow I'm an academic so you know we always um, have slideshows but I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep it interesting and um, this very diverse group we're talking to so um, I'll do my best to, to keep it interesting to all of you um, so I'm going to share my screen here and um, I trust you can all see that. Um, I, I suggest um, I just run through all the slides and then we keep the questions till, till after because I don't see all the, the, the you know, the chat line um, coming in. But I'm gonna talk about the democratization of space and how Africa launched its first nanosatellite to space. Now democratization may seem a very lofty and hefty idea, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna talk about a very exciting um, experience that we've had here many years ago with Africa's first CubeSat. And you can perhaps see uh, a model of a CubeSat here behind me. So this is what we're gonna talk about. Um, I'm from... Um, Maybe just to make you all envious, this is where I'm from. Um, this is Cape Town and the well-known Table Mountain uh, is at the southern tip of Africa. Um, my university is situated about 20 minutes from this mountain. Uh, just a little bit about my university. Um, as you can see, it's right here at the bottom end of Africa. Uh, it's the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. It's the largest university in, uh, in our province, which is called the Western Cape. Um, with about 32,000 students. We're only about 16 years old, um, quite, quite new. Diverse student population, 87% are black students. And the satellite program has been established here about 11 years ago, 12 years now, um, and is hosted by the French South African Institute of Technology and is funded by the South African government, particularly the Department of Science and Innovation. Uh, the South African Space Agency and um, the National Research Foundation. Uh, just to put you into the picture what's happening in the Western Cape, this is really the hub of the South African Space Program. So you can see CPUT location there in, in, a, in a town called Belleville. And then the National Satellite Integration Facilities is about a half an hour's drive from us. And you will also see the Oberberg test range, which can be used in future for launch of satellites, uh, is about an hour and a half drive from, from, from our university. So in, in that context, we are actually quite central to the hub of the space program in South Africa. Um, just a few slides on what you will see when you go to the National Satellite Integration Facilities. It was built in the 1980s. You can also see a previous satellite of South Africa that had been integrated at the top right hand side, uh, the big thermal vacuum chamber at the right bottom side, and the facilities, um, which is in a secluded radio quiet spot, um, as I've said, about an hour and a half drive from us in the mountains. The Overberg test range is uh, what can be used for um, launches of rockets in future, um, is, uh, is close to the coast, so that is ideally suited for rocket launch. And that might happen in the next few years. Here at CPUT, um, this is the building that, that we are housed in. We have a ground station that you can see here. Um, we are actually have two ground stations, um, one for operator for one for um, amateur bands and the other one for commercial band. We've got some test facilities um, and um, and uh, you know we, we, we've recently moved about three years ago into the new um, infrastructure, um, is, is, sorry, um, infrastructure and facilities at CPUT. Now, before I um, start with the kips at the fun part of the presentation, I think one should just remember um, why Africa and how is Africa going to space. Um, it might be 
surprising to you that Africa as a whole, all the member states came together and they have approved what we call African space policy. From that came um, the Africa space strategy. And that all um, links to what is being established, uh, which is the Africa Space Agency. And that will bring together all the strength of all the member states uh, and the infrastructure into a hub where it can serve the people of the continent. Uh, an interesting development uh, relevant to me as an academic and um, academia is the Pan-African University, which is an African-wide university, which is um, a platform or entity from the African Union. And um, it's got many focus areas. Uh, the space science focus areas has been given to Southern Africa and that will be hosted by CPUT in the future. Uh, you may ask why space program? Um, well, Africa, as you can see, is a very, very large continent. Uh, you can fit the United States, Argentina, even India, Europe and China, all in Africa, um, you know, um, in its geographical footprint. And, you know, to, to, to manage the resources of such a vast continent, obviously you need um, satellites to do that effectively from space. Uh, furthermore, um, it's my last formal slide, the African Union has 40 development goals and uh, more than 30 of them, almost all of them, can be served by space science uh, solutions. So this is really exciting time for to be in space uh, from an African um, perspective. I saw that some of you don't know much about this field, so let me just tell you what is a CubeSat. Uh, satellites come in various forms and uh, and and guises, and uh, they they mainly is classified as being large, medium, and small. And then the small satellites are further break, broken down to mini satellites, micro, nano, and pico satellites. And I will be talking about nano satellites. That that is where the CubeSat standard or the CubeSat um, fits in. It's more or less a one to ten kilogram satellite. What you can see there in front of you is what we call a 1U CubeSat. Um, it's cubic, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. Um, and then there's also a 3U satellite, um, which is a three unit satellite stacked three cubes of the 1U form factor to give you a larger satellites. And of course you get bigger ones now as well. Um, to your right hand side, you will see what we call a pod. Uh, the satellites are put in a pod. The pod are mounted to the rocket. The rocket, it goes into orbit. And once in orbit, uh, it jettisons all the CubeSats inside into space. So this is how we launch CubeSats. Uh, why the interest in nanosatellites? Well, um, many reasons. And if you compare them you know, to the first satellite that was launched ever, which was Sputnik in 1957, you can see a graphic here to your left. And then you can see a, a one-year CubeSat um, in relation to that. And this is really um, because of the advancement in electronics um, that we can pack so much more technology and functionality into a smaller space. And this is really why nanosatellites are so popular. And you can do that more cost effectively and, and the whole process and system can scale up to large constellations of satellites, which makes applications much more interesting. Now, um, let's meet ZQ1, which is an Africa first. Um, many years ago, um, 2013, um, ZQ1 uh, was launched uh, from Kazakhstan um, through a school uh, competition. Um, uh, a, a learner from a school called the Chapiso Sat. Chapiso means hope in Sichuan, which is a local um, indigenous language. And this is really what we wanted to, to enlighten uh, and light, light up is hope um, amongst the youngsters um, to go into space science. Now, you can see a picture there of um, ZQ1, which is a one-year CubeSat being put in the pot that I mentioned previously. What did the satellite have to do well it was mainly for capacity building remember it was our first one we didn't really know what we we're doing at the time so we had to learn uh, we had to demonstrate some technology that will be using later um, missions that i'll mention just now and it also had what we call a space weather um, or atmospheric characterization um, payload on board and a little camera 
I must just mention the little camera because uh, as you can see here is a picture of South Africa that was taken by, by the camera, which is essentially a webcam that we put on top of the satellite. Now, um, I'm going to show you a small video, um, the making of ZDQ-1. You will see it in the clean room, how it's stacked, how it's shipped, how it's launched. And the launch uh, footage is actual footage of the day. And right at the end, you will also hear the satellite speak to us, which um, still gives me goosebumps when I, when I watch it. So let me just play this video to you. I hope you enjoyed that video and just gives you an idea of the excitement that you can generate with these small satellites. Um, and uh, of course, we didn't stop there. Once we built SEDEC one, we learned a lot from it. So we established a lot of infrastructure for it. Um, we then moved on to a much larger satellite, three times the size. It's still quite small. This is the one that you see here um, at the back of me, um, ZDQ2. You can also see um, the, the, the satellite with the solar panels to the right there. And this satellite was launched um, in 2018. It's now been in space for just over two years, launched from Russia. As I've said, it's a three unit CubeSat, again, developed by students and staff that I'm very proud of. Um, the mission objectives was much more serious, I would say, than the, the previous satellites. For this one, we wanted to track ships along our coastline, and I'll show you some pictures from that. And it was also, um, a, we also developed a payload, as you can see at the bottom of the satellite, a, a twin camera system to detect felt fires. And then again, capacity building and it's, it's an ongoing learning experience, these satellites that you build. And it was also technology demonstration for future constellations that I will also mention in the next few slides. But let's just see here um, if I can activate this. Um, Just going to try and activate uh, this little video here of how the satellite is being put together in the clean room. And it's a finished product. So you can see the camera system at the bottom. Other things that you can see is mostly antennas, you know, to speak to the ground station. And you see a lot of solar panels because you, you need a lot of power to do these things. And you get that from the sun that, 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 um, that obviously um, load the batteries, charge the batteries on board. And uh, I must also just say that this mission too was, got, was sponsored by our government, the Space Agency and the National Research Foundation. Right, um, I'm, I've prepared a small animation video for you to tell the ZDQ story because um, it can be much more interesting to be told than, than I can. So here's a little two minute clip um, of what ZDQ2 was going to do and is doing right now. 
On 21 November 2013, the Cape Peninsula University of Technology launched Africa's first nano satellite, ZA Cube 1, also called Tabiso Set. This pioneering satellite paved the way for ZA Cube 2, our most advanced nano satellite to date. It was launched on 27 December 2018 from Russia, weighing only 3.7 kilograms. It took 6,000 engineering hours to complete. The satellite was also built by the CPUT satellite program, which was established in 2009 as a strategic initiative by the DST to support and transform the growing national space industry. The program boasts cutting edge innovations in space technology and has produced more than 70 postgraduates. In support of national initiatives like Operation Pakisa, CPUT took the lead in developing space applications that support maritime domain awareness throughout our vast and economically lucrative exclusive economic zone. One such service, Automatic Identification System, or AIS, detects the position of vessels in our EEZ and transmits this data to a control center. This service identifies ships that enter our marine protected areas for illegal fishing. In 2016, the DST commissioned the first of a constellation of nano satellites to provide AIS services. Work on ZA Cube 2 started soon after. ZA Cube 2 is operated from the CPUT ground station with backup support through the Space Tech ground station at Haltech. The satellite receives AIS signals from the vessels in our coastal waters. This data is pulled into the National Oceans and Coastal Information Management System, which was developed by the CSIR, an entity of the DST, specifically for Operation Pakisa. You are looking at the first ever AIS data generated by proudly South African satellite technology. We will now no longer be reliant on foreign AIS service providers. Moreover, the innovative technologies on ZAQ2, co-developed with South African company Stone 3 will in future support secure maritime communications. This is of strategic importance for the country and the South African Navy. ZAQ2 is proudly South African. The mission transformed the full space industry value chain supporting a number of black-owned SMMEs. It is pioneering a future of constellations of nano satellites into orbit, positioning us as the space hub of Africa and leading the country's response to the fourth industrial revolution. Watch the space. Right, so ZDQ2 has been in orbit for two years. Um, it's still um, doing what it's supposed to do. Um, wonderfully successful mission. Um, and here you can see um, just a, it's not really a picture, it's, it's, it's the beacons that we see from ships and the positions that we pick up and then we plot geographically. Um, so you can see the ships along the shipping lanes around um, Southern Africa. Uh, it's not just South Africa that we're interested in. Uh, obviously, it's a global solution. The satellite orbits the whole of the Earth, so we can also track ships elsewhere um, in the world, uh, particularly in Southern Africa, which is of interest to our neighbors. And um, we also tested it far away, um, as far as Australia. But as I've said, we can literally look at uh, or track ships anywhere in the world, depending on where we switch on what we call the payload on the satellite. Uh, more interesting probably for you is, is, is the pictures that we get from the camera system. Um, just two pictures here for you to show what kind of um, resolution we get. It's a 60 meter resolution camera, which is a medium resolution. Um, and you can see a overhead photo of Abu Dhabi on your left hand side. And then you can see a picture of Cape Town um, and the Cape Peninsula to your right. Um, this is the same picture really as the map that I've showed you previously of where CPUT is located. All right, but where are we going from here? You know, it's a lot of excitement has happened over 10 years, um, but we're now looking at expanding the current satellites um, to constellations of satellites. And why would we want to do that? And it's all for tracking ships, mostly around our coastline and for Africa as well. Um, if you look at ZA Cube 2, it's a single satellite. It orbits the Earth, as you can see on the right hand side. And um, South Africa moves around it about every 90 minutes. Uh, the Earth, well, the, the satellite rotates around the Earth. Um, but you can see with one satellite, you pass over CPUT, and then it's quite a while before you will pass over South Africa again. So what we call the revisit time uh, is not that great. 
Um, you may see a ship early in the morning and then you may see a ship um, only in the evening again. And obviously it's, it's, it would have sailed quite a far way um, between those events. So um, what you really want to have is more eyes uh, in the sky. And this is exactly what we are doing now. Uh, we are busy developing three satellites that will augment ZDQ2 and they will all be uh, in what we call the same plane. But now with more satellites in space, you're going to be able to pass over CPUT and South Africa by implication more times or more regularly. So you will be able to track ships more regularly. We call this mission MDASAT-1, um, meaning there is going to be other MDASAT constellations as well. Uh, MDASAT-1 is a constellation of three satellites, as I've mentioned. Um, it's slightly smaller than ZDQ2, but it's larger than ZDQ1. So it's sort of mid, middle, in the middle between those two form factors, and they are two unit sizes um, of CubeSats. We could make it smaller than ZDQ2 because we essentially uh, remove the, the, the camera system, which we don't need at this point. We only need the payload that received the ship beacons on board. Um, these satellites will be launched from Russia in the third quarter of this year. So watch um, social media, follow us. Um, you will see the Twitter feed just now. Um, and um, yeah, hopefully um, more, more success for us towards the end of this year to track more ships. Uh, ultimately, our goal will be nine satellites. And here you will see, you can, you can see all the satellites orbiting here in what we call three planes. Um, and with so many satellites in three planes distributed to us around the globe, um, you'll be able to track ships. We estimate at a roughly 45 minutes revisit time. It means that the same ship you will track every 45 minutes its position and the ship does not go that far in 45 minutes. So that is adequate for us. We will call that MDA SAT2 and that will be launched in two years time. Um, of course, we will not stop there. There will be MDA set three and four, et cetera, because um, I have not mentioned this, but Cube says they only last two to five years in space. Um, and because of the electronics that you use on it, um, the sun degrades it and you have to replace the satellite. And then MDA set three will replenish the, the, the old satellites, but we will also make the satellite constellation larger because we don't just want to provide um, the service for Southern Africa, we want to provide it for the whole globe. And the more satellites you have in space, the more data you have, and the more coverage you have of, this, of, the, of the larger globe. So this is what we aim for from, I would say, um, small beginnings at AQ1. And in 10 years time, we're now looking at a constellation of nine satellites. And um, it's all done by students and staff at university. I hope that make you enthusiastic about where you are is definitely um, in India with a very vibrant space program. You can do all of this on your side as well. And I hope that um, you are excited as I am still um, doing this. Um, that's all I wanted to, to say to you today. Um, we'll, we'll get to questions and answers just now. I just want to thank you and all the official languages of South Africa that you see there. And you can follow us at Society Space or you can visit our um, website um, mentioned there. I believe these presentations will be shared um, as well um, online. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Professor Anzil. That was very interesting. And uh, just one second. Yeah, I must uh, appreciate you for uh, how many visuals you put in. That was really nice. And the animated movie was definitely a plus. You know, we tend to absorb a lot more when we see more visuals and, uh, you know, tend to associate better. So that was very, very interesting. And I think such a unique topic that, uh, you know, we got to hear about. And honestly, we don't hear so much about nanosatellites and CubeSats um, uh, with regards to the entire space tech technology, space exploration, uh, uh, ecosystem. I'm so grateful that you brought this uh, to our festival. So I think
think I just lost the link. Um, professor, uh, I'm so I sorry. I can see you again. Thank you. <laughs> I got worried there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about that. I think I had a bit of an internet connection issue. But I was just saying that, you know, this topic is not very well known and not much talked about. So I think it's really great that you could bring this to our festival. And we're really grateful to you for the same. So um, let me just start with the questions. Now, we've, we've received quite a few interesting questions. And I'm going to start reading them out one by one. The first one would be, what is the future plan with this nano satellite? What do we see in the next 10 years? What would its applications be? Um, that is a very good question. Um, and a lot of companies are setting up to pursue nano satellite technology. Um, I can speak for myself. For ourselves, we are looking towards the service for ship tracking. As I've said, we want to augment. The AIS that was mentioned is but one example, and there are next generation AIS called VDES, VHF Data Exchange Service, which is a machine to machine communication technology. And this is where we are pushing nano satellites, it's in the machine to machine and Internet of Things um, application. And you will see many more around the world doing that. Um, but of course, it's also there for. Um, advanced earth observation, you, you can, you, you, you can, with the larger CubeSats, you can get very high resolution pictures of the ground. And because you have so many satellites for the price of a bigger satellite in space, your revisit times uh, become so much um, shorter. It means that you can cover disaster areas almost in real time if you have enough satellites. You can track the disasters more regularly. So um, it, there's a wide range of of applications that will that is being pursued. Um, what what's might, it might be a question that pops up um, later. One obviously has to be cognizant of space debris and the sustainable use of space because everybody's pushing thousands of satellites into space. Yeah. But there again, there's a lot of innovation happening. You know, it's how can we bring back the satellites after their service? has expired in space. You know, the moment they die, you want to take them out of the orbit so they don't pose a, a, um, a risk to any other satellite that's operating in space. So the CubeSat community, I speak on behalf of the CubeSat community, is very cognizant of that to be a responsible user of space. And there's a lot of technologies being developed for that. So uh, from a technology perspective, a lot of development is happening, exciting development. I would say IoT, machine to machine, is a very important application area that is being pursued by CubeSats at least from my perspective. No, that sounds very interesting. You know, uh, I think it, it's really going to blow up in the next coming years. And uh, it's interesting Absolutely. to know, yeah, it will be interesting to know what applications we could, um, like you said, one would be disaster management, uh, IoT, very, very interesting uh, areas that one could explore yeah. thanks to nano satellite. Okay, so the next question that we have for you here is, so uh, this looks, um, our attendee says, this looks very interesting. What technical skills would you need to be in the nano satellite industry? That is exciting, bit. almost everybody from a technology point of view can participate in nano satellites because nano satellites, well, satellites per se, are um, involving multidisciplinary disciplines. Yeah. Um, I mean, you need power systems, you need computer systems, you need payloads, you need science payloads, you need um, structural engineers, you need data scientists, you know, to tap into the data and mine the data. You need network engineers, you need all sorts of engineers, technologists and technicians and scientists to be part of this. So, um, and, and then obviously there's the regulatory aspect. So there's exciting developments in law, space law. So even lawyer, you can become involved. And obviously um, we in this to make business. There are new business models to be developed with CubeSat Constellation. So we need economists, financial planning, all of that. And then there's futurists, you know, you just ask the question, what can we do with CubeSats? I don't have all the answers. What I want to put in place is the tools that somebody else can come up with wonderful ideas to use the technology that we have. So really anybody 
Uh, and then there's also the social uh, integration or, or the integration of technology with society. So you, see, you, you can't ignore the social sciences as well. So you're looking at this whole ecosystem of bringing space to the people on the ground. Um, and this is where the democratization comes in. Everybody can participate in the value of space is broad. Yeah, I think that was very interesting because you mentioned so many fields and not just <laughs> related to technology. I mean, you brought in law and business and entrepreneurship. So I'm, I'm so sure that all our attendees have, um, you know, learned a little bit from this and, you know, just goes to show that it can invite people from different spheres. Um, so that's very interesting. So, um, Join us. <laughs> I'm sure many of our attendees will. <laughs> so, um, so the next question is, um, for getting more information near South Africa, can't we use a geosynchronous satellite rather than launching many satellites? Yeah, um, obviously um, there's pros and cons to both. You, 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 you need more than one type of satellite to provide services, all services that you require. Geosynchronous satellites, they're very far from, from, from Earth, so there is what we call latency. Um, if you were to make a phone call in the old days through a geosynchronous um, line, um, there would have been a second or two delay, and that, that causes problems. Um, uh, Internet of Things will not work that well because you need a lot of power to reach the satellite and to, to beam it back to Earth and receive it. So your modules are typically very small on Earth, cannot transmit that much power to geosynchronous satellites. So that's why you need satellites much closer to the Earth because the path is shorter, so you need less power. And this is the name of the game when you talk Internet of Things because the sensors out there must be autonomous and must be worked for many, many years. Um, uh, geosynchronous satellite only see one spot of the Earth. It might see it constantly, but it only sees one spot. Um, it doesn't give you global coverage. So you need more than one geosynchronous satellite anyway to give you global coverage. But global coverage can also do with a constellation of very small satellites, really at the fraction of the price of the geosynchronous yeah. satellites. So um, yeah, there's definitely, a, there's definitely a place for all of them. I might be in a nano satellite world, but I'm not saying this is all the answers you need. It's some of the answers, it's exciting answers. Oh, definitely, sir. Which brings us to the next question. Um, you mentioned, you know, there is space for all, but what would the advantages over uh, of a nano satellite be over other satellites? Can you uh, maybe shed some light on that? Philosophically, I would almost say is everybody can participate in it. And this is really just coming back to, to what I want to bring home, the democratization of space. Literally every country on, 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 on Earth can, within its resources, participate in the nanosatellite experience and benefit from, from the data that you get. I showed you real data that we get from a single satellite. Imagine the data you can get from more than one satellite. And then um, nanosatellites being um, scalable, and there's a certain standard amongst them, more than one group and more than one country can work together and complement data. So if you look at the Pan-African uh, context, at least each country can contribute to CubeSat and we can all share the data. Yeah. Uh, but really it's about um, you bringing down the technology and resource threshold of participating in space because the cost is a lot smaller than your bigger satellites. And because we use what we call commercial off the shelf technologies, you can integrate satellites for far less. And the development time is shorter and you can use students to, to develop these. Um, so all of that, I, I think is, is exciting package for, for nano satellites. No, no, definitely. Like you mentioned, uh, you know, the very thought of each country in Africa making their own nano satellite and, you know, launching it into space. Uh, that would exactly. really democratize so many things, uh, which, you know, further gets me to my next question. Uh, so we don't hear much about Africa's space program. And uh, does Africa plan to collaborate with other countries on their space programs? Because we see NASA, ESA, even ISRO in India, 
yes, collaborating uh, so much over you know different space programs so we'd like Absolutely. to know what africa has planned ahead um i, I don't know all the details i'm just um knowing that a lot of development has been taking place you know for establishing the policy and then putting an implementation plan on the ground because all of these things need to happen and it's a slow process because there are more than 50 neighboring, so not neighboring, but participating states that you have to bring together. And that's really being done. Um, the space agency that will be established will definitely have links with other space agencies across the world. Um, but global participation, I must say, as an equal member is important for Africa. And um, just from a South African perspective, what brings India and South Africa together is the BRICS um, countries, Brazil, yeah. Russia, India, and South Africa, yeah. and China. And of course, we're looking at a joint work there as well in space from a South African perspective. So definitely, uh, we're not trying to do everything ourselves, but we do, when we, in, when we participate and when we collaborate, we really want to do that as equal partners. Um, with whomever we participate and this is so important then why we need an indigenous um, strength as well and this is what nano satellites do you grow the students you, you grow the infrastructure to build the more i would say conventional the more complex missions that's also required to fulfill all your developmental um, challenges and so definitely needs. no no uh, like you said uh, you know the very idea of having an equal participation i think like in the whole space exploration industry um like you said the first very steps are establishing a policy for the countries for for a for a continent as large and vast as africa it will really take some time but i'm sure there's a lot being done and we'll hear about it in due course of time um so you, will definitely question, hear more about it. you will definitely hear, your, hear more about it very, very soon. There's a lot of activity happening behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. We're definitely excited to hear more. And perhaps at the next festival, you could tell us about the next big thing that's being done. Um, I think we have time for one more question. It says, uh, how is the CubeSat so power efficient? Sorry, just repeat that. Uh, how is the CubeSat power efficient? That is a very, very important question. Um, you know, on ZQube 1, we only had about 1.5, maybe 2 watt of power that we can use, and that's less than the light on a bicycle. <laughs> you do everything that you want. So all your subsystems must be very, very, very power efficient. And that's, that's part of the challenges of, of being in a satellite business, especially nano satellite business. It has to be small, contained, yeah and it has to be very, very power efficient. Um, the batteries are improving, the solar panels are improving. We're also looking at deployable solar panels to enlarge the, the area that the sun uh, rays or energy is captured. So we're working at this from many ways. We're looking at capturing more energy and then also we're looking at more energy efficient um, subsystems. And that goes for all subsystems. That's really a, a good question. And one of the challenges that you will face when you get into, into the satellite business. The other, the, the other factor is obviously you, you, you build so much complexity in a very, very small package um, that heating becomes a problem. And in space, um, you don't have um, heat um, con by convection release. Um, so you are limited of how you can get rid of heat. So all of these aspects um, from a mechanical point of view becomes very interesting. Definitely, sir. I think a lot of times you do, uh, I can see that in your discussion, you do take, uh, make it a point to mention uh, how the space industry has to be energy efficient. It can't, it, it really cannot add to the existing pollution. Uh, you also mentioned, you know, the ethical aspects of space exploration, so not democratizing space does not mean that we start exploiting it in every way possible. Absolutely. That, that's, a, that's a great point. That, that uh, which I have point. learned from you <laughs> while discussing <laughs> with you. So um, I think that was very, very enriching, sir. Um, I think that has brought us to the end of the Q&A. It was really great having you at India Science Festival, Professor Van Zyl. 
an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for taking out the time and thank you for answering all these questions so patiently. It was an absolute pleasure and everybody just keep safe out there. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Um, Bye-bye then. I'd like to tell all our attendees that apart from these uh, talks and panel discussions, we also have very interesting games uh, at our festival. So make sure you head over to our website and check out the games that we have. We also have a feedback form. Uh, so if you have liked this talk, you have attended it, do tell us what you like best about it. Um, tell us how we can improve our talks because we want to make this a seamless experience. So there's a feedback form in your chat. Uh, please do take out the time to fill it up. Um, a very important part of our festival are the international competitions that we organize. We have uh, three major competitions that we are running at India Science Festival. The first is talk your thesis. The second is perform your project. And the third one is spin your science. Now, talk your thesis is about um, PhD, uh, MS postdoc researchers explaining their thesis in 10 minutes. Perform your project is all about presenting a science uh, project to an audience. And the third one is a science fiction writing competition. Now our festival has, um, we had a lot of participants coming in through the whole of 2020 and we shortlisted our top uh, finalists for perform your project, talk your thesis as well as in your science. Today, I'm very happy to invite Atharva, who is one of the finalists of Perform Your Project, who will be presenting his project in front of you all. And uh, this presentation will be key in deciding whether or not he wins the Perform Your Project competition. Atharva, thank you so much for joining in. It is a pleasure to have you here. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, share my PPT. Yeah, you can share your screen. All set. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, am I audible and visible? Can you uh, maybe just increase your volume a little? Uh, I think your voice is uh, slightly lower. Uh, is it fine now? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Yeah. Let's begin, okay. Atharva. Yeah, so uh, hello, everyone. My name is Atharva Valanju. I'm a first year BSMS research student at ISA Pune, and I'm currently from Mumbai, Maharashtra. So my topic for today is how to grow your own bioluminescent bacteria and its applications. So in this presentation, I'll be going over a brief overview of what is bioluminescence, then how to perform your experiment, and then the applications of your own bioluminescent bacteria. So let me start with a fundamental question. What is bioluminescence? It is the production and emission of light by a living organism. Now, most of you might have seen bioluminescence in a firefly. But did you also know that there are a variety of microorganisms which show bioluminescence? Like in these examples, this is a glowing colony of bacteria that I'll be talking about further. And this is the glowing shoreline of a beach. So this is actually an algae known as Noctiluca. You might have heard about this in recent news that beaches have started glowing. And this is a macroscopic organism known as jellyfish, which I also actually glows. So since we're on the topic of bioluminescence, I would like to introduce this uh, organism known as Aquaria victorians. This is a type of jellyfish. And in 1962, a group of scientists extracted a protein, this GFP protein, the green fluorescent protein, from this ring that you see in this uh, jellyfish. And this protein has now become one of the most important tagging tools to be used in bioscience. And so this was given the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. So this is what the uh, protein actually looks like. This is the 3D amino acid structure of the protein. And this is how it looks like when you tag it to a cell. So uh, say, suppose you have an invisible protein and you want to see where the protein is going throughout your body or where it is getting activated. So what you can actually do is that you can tag that uh, GFP protein to your invisible protein. And so that so you will be able to entirely see the structure of that protein and wherever the protein is going, the GFP protein will also glow with it. So that is how this is one important application. And then uh, let us learn about a little bit more about the bacteria that we are going to grow. So the name of the bacteria is Vibrio fischeri. It is also known as Ali Vibrio fischeri. It is a cylindrical bacteria having a flagella. And an important point is that it is found globally in marine environments. This means that even if you are harvesting it from the Indian Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean, 
you will be able to find this bacteria. So that is how we will be able to harvest it. And it exists in symbiosis with marine animals. So this is how we're going to harvest it. So now bioluminescence actually takes place by the luciferase luciferin system. But luciferase is an enzyme which acts on the substrate known as luciferin to produce the glow that we can all see. And the group of genes that helps with this reaction are together known as Lux operon. So these are the group of genes that help in the bioluminescence reaction. So what if I told all of you that you could grow your own bioluminescent bacteria sitting right at home without requiring any expensive uh, equipment? Wouldn't that be interesting? So let us learn how to do that. So first you'll require a squid. Don't worry, it won't be a live one. You'll require one which you can find in your local fish market, but make sure it's not frozen, right? Then you would need agar medium. So agar medium to grow the bacteria in, you would need TSA agar, salt, and water, dog salt and water. So this is the uh, culture in which you're going to grow your bacteria in. And then you would need petri plates to hold the bacteria. These are what petri plates look like, and they will hold the agar medium. Then you would require Q-tip or loop of wire to transfer the medium. And finally, you would require a pressure cooker for sterilization. So in microbiology, sterilization is important because you want to make sure that the bacteria that you are growing is not a foreign bacteria. You want to grow only the bacteria that you want. Okay, so that is all the equipment you need. Now, once you have your squid, you want to harvest the bacteria. So uh, remember that the bacteria is actually present in the light organ of the squid. So what you need to do is you need to cut the uh, squid open vertically like this, and then you'll be able to see the light organ. So this is what the light organ actually looks like. It's a silvery organ. You'll be able to find it fairly quickly once you cut it open. And once you remove this light organ, just squeeze it out so that all the ink is accumulated. And this is what the ink looks like. And this ink has the bacteria that we are going to need. So now how do you prepare your agar medium? What you do is, it's simple, right? You take four grams of agar, three grams of salt, put it in 100 ml of water, and heat it till the agar dissolves. Then put the entire thing in your pressure cooker and keep a few petri plates on top, and then uh, close the pressure cooker and keep it on a medium flame for 15 minutes. And once it starts whistling and 15 minutes are over, switch it off. And after cooling, your sterilized agar medium is now ready, okay? Now you just have to follow the simple procedure in which you take your Q-tip or a loop of fire. Or for that matter, you can even take a sterilized toothpick. Then you dip it into your ink and then you uh, streak it on your Petri plate. What do I mean by streak? You move it in this pattern. So in this pattern, you streak it on your Petri plate. You close the Petri plate. Keep it in a, a dark location for 24 to 48 hours. And that's it. You've grown your own bacteria. So let me show what it actually looks like. So this is what it looks like. Uh, on day one when I've just done it. So this, you can see these streaks, right? So this is the ink and this is the petri plate holding the bacteria. So this is what it looked like after 24 hours. This is in the normal light. And finally, after 36 hours and the night time, this is what it looks like. These are the bacterial colonies which are actually glowing and these are violins. So you can do this too if you follow the steps I told you. So now some of you might be wondering if we had a bacterial colony to begin with, why did it start glowing so late, right? If there was bacteria, it should have glowed from day one. Why was there such a time lag? Let me explain this with the help of an analogy. Say I wanted to light up a football field and you gave me one light bulb. Wouldn't it be useless? I would require at least hundreds of light bulbs to produce a glow good enough to light a football field. A similar mechanism takes place in this bacteria. Only when you have a population density which has crossed a certain threshold does the bacteria produce enough light to actually be visible. So this phenomenon is actually known as quorum sensing, and this is what actually takes place in the bacteria. Okay, so now why was there bacteria in the squid, right? So this is because there exists a symbiotic relationship between the squid and the bacteria, where both of them help each other, and they are mutually beneficial for each other. So the bacteria is provided a nutrient medium to stay in, and the squid is actually provided camouflage. So you can see that these are these glowing bacterial colonies that are actually in the squid. Now let's move on to the applications. Bioluminescent bacteria has had applications from ancient times. Like if I talk about the American Civil War, there was a phenomenon known as angel's glow, but in certain soldiers have actually had wounds that were glowing, like you can see here. And these soldiers had a much better chance of recovery. So it took science actually 139 years to find out why this worked, right? So we were able to find out that there actually exists this uh, bioluminescent bacteria that I've written about here which is actually growing in those wounds 
and it was producing a chemical that killed other bacteria. So what we call an antibiotic today. So that actually killed other pathogenic bacteria from growing. So that was how those wounds were glowing. And that was actually a phenomenon known as angel's glow. So now you grow your own bacteria and it looks good, but what can you actually do with it? You can build your very own water toxicity tester. Now this is because the bioluminescence system is highly sensitive to any heavy metals, say lead and mercury. It interferes with the metabolism of the bacteria. So what you can do is you can actually take your petri plate and in half of the petri plate, you can put normal water and in the other half, you can put contaminated water and then you can compare the glow. And so if the heavy metal reduces the glow, so you will be easily able to see which water is toxic and which is not. So now let's move on to the future. What are the applications of this bioluminescent technology? One of the applications is glowing plants, plants whose leaves have a visible glow. So in nature, of course, there are no plants that are glowing, but with the help of DNA recombination and genetic engineering, we are now able to produce plants who give off a sustainable visible glow. So this is actually done by taking the luciferin gene from a bacteria or a fungus and inserting it into the plant DNA so that the plant also produces luciferin and then the entire cycle takes place and it glows. So uh, it is not a distant future indeed to think that lamps or other light sources may soon be replaced by plants with glowing leaves, right? Imagine the amount of energy that would be saved if instead of street lights, you had glowing trees on both sides of the sidewalks, right? And all this energy would actually be transformed into green energy. Okay, so uh, that was the end of my presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Um, Atharva, I have a question for you. Yeah. How did you get um, inspired to make a pro uh, project on bioluminescence? Like what, a, what attracted you towards this? Uh, actually, the bioluminescence organisms give off a glow which is 98% efficient. So I was thinking that how can we uh, make energy which is much more efficient? Like when we talk about light bulbs, uh, most of the energy goes out in heat, right? So we need some technology wherein you are able to utilize the energy efficiently. So I learned more about it and that was bioluminescence. And then I wanted to see if I could grow my own bioluminescent things. And so this bacteria was actually comparatively uh, beneficial to me. So that was why I did it. That's lovely. And uh, oh, we have, a quest we have questions for you. So <laughs> let me uh, ask you the questions. Yeah. Uh, the color that we get is generally green or can we have other colors too? Uh, actually, the protein that I talked about, the GFP protein, that can be modified to produce red, orange, and blue. So if you just change one amino acid, you can change the entire color of the bioluminescence. So you get it in a variety of colors if you can actually change an amino acid. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, so we can have all the colors that we yes. want is what you're saying. Yes. So that's lovely. Okay, so um, another question that uh, we have received is what could the applications potentially be if we were to use bioluminescence further? Uh, so suppose you had you wanted to test the toxicity of a stream of river or uh, say any water body. You can just introduce this bacteria into that stream and see if that bacteria, the amount of light that that bacteria is giving, right? So if, it, if the water body has some contaminants, say some heavy metals like mercury or lead poisoning, the bacteria will not give any uh, light. So we can clearly see that it is polluted. So you don't wouldn't need to introduce any foreign chemical to see if it is polluted. You can just naturally introduce this bacteria. And you have that the sounds, application of plants that glow. Well, that sounds really good and sustainable. Yeah, so you can do it. But that's very interesting, Atharva. That was very, very informative. Thank yeah, you thank so much. You. Thank you. I, I really liked your presentation myself. Thank and I'm you. sure so did our attendees. Very well done. I can see why you made it to the final round of Perform Your you. Project. Very well done. So here's Thank hoping that your um, project um, gets you a prize too. But in any so. case, very, very well done. I think it was really great listening to you. Thanks Thank so you. much, Tarwa. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, uh, you all got a chance to see a very interesting project by Atharva. And this was, like I mentioned, uh, one of the final projects for um, Perform Your Project. Uh, an international competition that we hosted at India Science Festival. Um, I think 
like I mentioned at the very beginning, our festival has a bunch of uh, talks, panel discussions that are uh, focused around space, health, and robotics. The first talk that we uh, heard was on uh, space. And now the second one is going to be about health. It gives me great pleasure. It's an absolute honor that I have um, uh, with us here today. Uh, Dr. Abhay Bang joining us from Gachiroli. Uh, sir, if I could please request you to turn on your audio and video. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to host you at India Science Festival. Uh, I would just like to tell all our attendees that Dr. Bang is a very, very well-known public health expert, and he is the founder of Search in Gachiroli. I, I think everybody has heard about him. He's a social activist and a researcher working in the field of community health. And he has received a number of prizes and uh, accolades for the wonderful work that he has done in community health in Maharashtra. Uh, sir, thank you so much for joining us. We are all very excited to hear the talk. I'd just like to tell all our attendees that they can type in their questions in the Q&A box and, uh, and Dr. Bang will be answering the questions at the very end. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. And I, I'm, I'm truly grateful to India Science Festival for this uh, interaction with the young generation and with the scientists and the students. It's a great opportunity. Uh, can we have the first slide, please, Sheetal? My, my colleague Sheetal is assisting me. I am completely IT blind person. So what I intend to speak today, or rather actually our organizers have chosen this topic for me to speak. Arogya Swaraj. I, I, I'm not talking about a small research project, which of course is equally intellectually exciting, but I'm, I, I intend to talk today about a larger concept, Arogya Swaraj, which really means achieving health freedom by empowering individuals and the communities. Next, please. Today, when the COVID pandemic is going on, but even before COVID pandemic, it has become extremely risky to fall sick. Unlimited technological possibilities are there. You can have transplant of practically every organ only except brain. But then there are huge cost levels. So at the end of a treatment of a serious disease like cancer or heart disease, either you die or you go bankrupt. So falling sick is a very bad situation today. And the World Bank data tells us that annually six crore people in India slip below the poverty line due to the cost of medical care. Ah. So we, the doctors, the medical establishment who are supposed to save lives, we of course save lives, but then at the same time, we make people poor, we make people bankrupt. So the challenge of healthcare in India, apart from COVID and COVID vaccine, which I hope will be temporary challenges, but the major challenge, challenge of decades is how to provide accessible and affordable healthcare to 1.4 billion people living in 1 million villages, hamlets, and towns. Ah, it's a it's fabulous challenge. Challenge of practically astronomical order. And that is the healthcare challenge which India is facing. Now, what I how do I deal with this issue with you? I want to tell initially a story to you. Gadchiroli's story. Gadchiroli is a place where I have been living, working for the past 35 years. So I'll initially tell you the Gadchiroli story. 
it's not about to boast what we have done but about the data about the practical reality that the story will share with you and then from that we will try to arrive at some solutions for providing health care to the 1.4 billion indian people now where is gadchiroli you see on the map maharashtra about 1000 kilometers from bombay or mumbai is this red area that you see is gadchiroli so gadchiroli is very away far away from metropolitan cities it is the poorest district in maharashtra nearly 1500 villages spread out with huge distances 40% population in the district is gond tribe madia gond tribe so they their whole thinking knowledge level lifestyle is centuries i don't want to use the word behind but it is centuries away from rest of the mainstream population of india paddy cultivation is the main occupation so only one crop in a year medical care is usually not available and so people resort to beliefs in gods and goddesses outside every tribal village under a mahua tree you will find this kind of deities each god or goddess specializes in one disease and they are supposed to save you so if you don't have medical care people need some consolation some satisfaction so gods and goddesses and intermittently you also hear bomb blasts because this this district has got very active naxalite movement so there there can't be probably a place with more complex challenges handicaps we my wife rani and i and about 150 our colleagues we all together work in this in this district for the past 35 years this is our research village we call it shodha gram like mahatma gandhi seva gram where I, i i grew up in seva gram ashram of mahatma gandhi this is our shodha gram from where we are searching for health care solutions for rural india and this is the organization search it's a public trust through which we work so this is the introductory part i have no intention to go in more details about organization but what i want to share with you is what we have learned in this laboratory of 134 villages surrounding 134 villages are our population laboratory and for the past 32 years we are monitoring nearly 100000 1 lakh population every individual every birth every death it's one of the longest sites there are such 22 sites world over where a long term population monitoring and data has been done so this is this these 134 villages our are our laboratory so when we came here more than 3 decades ago naturally the question in our mind was what are the priority health problems for the people in gadchiroli and people of gadchiroli for us they were a sample of the population in india they represented rural tribal population in india nearly nearly 80 crore 90 crore people now so what are their problems how do you know you can of course know that through data but what is people's belief what do people want so rani and i went of course i, I used to look younger at that time but we went from village to village and then held meetings around night fire and ask directly ask the people what are main health problems on which you would like us to work for you and then we organized what we call people's health assemblies where representatives of villagers came and actually and this is very interesting uh, not so much scientific but i i would say a political democracy at the grassroots that we ask people to vote on which health problem they wanted search our organization to start work 
and through this voting people gave us some priorities which which were burning health problems for them i am not going through all the priorities but one of the priority was our children die this was a very moving priority children used to get sick people didn't have scientific knowledge health care was very rudimentary in the district the nearest city with health care was nearly 200 kilometers away even the ceo of zilla parishad the ias officer just a few months before we went there his young son 9 month old died of pneumonia in this district even ias officers baby couldn't be treated what would happen to the children in tribal villages children in the deep forest and so it's very naturally that people especially women express this as a main concern that our children die can you do something so then i'll come to that subsequently but then also hospital people need hospital care but what kind of hospital care people need so when we asked them they said we are afraid of big buildings of hospitals we are afraid of the white coats that the doctors wear aprons so we asked them what is there to be afraid of the white coat and they said in the tribal people they said there is a custom that when somebody dies the dead body is wrapped in white cloth and then buried so so people said that those who are already wrapped in white cloth how can they save anybody they are already dead and then finally they confided that in those hospital modern hospitals there is no god so they they don't go to they don't want to go to hospital so what sort of hospital should be built for them so we designed a different kind of hospital 30 years ago a tribal friendly hospital a hospital of huts where a patient tribal rural patient wouldn't feel alien but would feel as if he has come to his own village and then now for the past 30 years this hospital is providing care including very modern operation theater and surgery so hospital care people need medical care but the hospital care should be accessible within the distance should be homely and friendly should have an atmosphere of respect and dignity and should be affordable to the people but what about those who can't reach hospital like the problem we've discussed earlier our children die children were dying without reaching the hospital children like this newborn babies most of the deliveries in those days were occurring in villages at home home deliveries conducted by traditional illiterate traditional birth attendant called dai and these newborn babies are very fragile very vulnerable they they are low birth weight they are preterm with slight exposure to the cold they become cold it's called hypothermia if they are hungry they cry if they become hypoglycemic they just stop crying you feel our ah, baby is all right now no baby has got hypoglycemia they develop infection very soon and they either cry or they become quiet and they die and nobody understood so a newborn baby the babies were born in that home delivery room for about 10 days nobody could go inside except for the old woman dai and after 10 days mother would come out with a alive baby or baby might have died been dead in those 10 days so newborn babies <clears throat> was the major cause of child mortality globally also of all the child mortality nearly 50% to 60% <clears throat> child mortality occurs among the newborn babies when we say newborn the first 28 days of life first 4 weeks of life is called technically it's called newborn period 
So newborn deaths was a major issue. And look, this was the traditional, this is a home delivery room. The photograph I took in a village called Murza. Now here you can see that woman is lying on a charpoil. <clears throat> she has delivered maybe five, six days ago. She is still emaciated, anemic, tired, maybe sick. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this newborn baby, low birth weight, the old woman who is dying is providing care to the baby. This baby now being low birth weight and exposed in this way may become hypothermic. And look at that cow dung plastered floor and the dusty soles of that woman. Now, it's full of dust and cow dung and billions of bacteria. Now, the distance between that baby's bare body and billions of bacteria is hardly three inches. No wonder these babies become cold, they become infected, they become sick and many of them die. So the challenge before us is, these babies won't reach to hospital, but the medical science must reach where the babies are. So we decided to turn the logic of healthcare and uh, instead of waiting in the hospital for babies to arrive, we decided that hospital care must go where the babies are born and where they are dying. Who would do that? Doctors were not willing to come to Garchulis. Forget about going to the homes and villages, but they were not willing to come to even Garchuli. Garchuli is known as Kalapani. And in general, doctors don't want to go to rural areas, tribal areas. So we selected one woman per village. This woman, her name is Kajubai. Kajubai is a seventh standard fail. She studied seven years but failed a woman in, from a village called Ambeshuni. She is a Dalit woman. And one such woman who was literate, who was willing to work day and night, who even in the night go for attending home deliveries and providing care to sick neonet, one such woman was selected from each village. Such 39 women were selected from 39 villages. They became our barefoot neonatologist. Our design was that in the absence of doctors, we'll make one village woman a barefoot neonatologist per village so that the care will be available in each village to all 24 hours, 365 days in a year. So Kajubai was selected from Ambeshuni and such 39 women from 39 villages were selected. Why 39? Because we wanted to test this model of newborn care. It was an outrageous model. <clears throat> World Health Organization at that time, and this is year 1993-94 when I designed this, this approach, the recommendation of World Health Organization at that time that sick newborn is a very serious affair. Don't touch, immediately refer to hospital, but where were the hospitals? You could only satisfy yourself that I have sent the baby to the hospital, but baby wouldn't go anywhere. Baby would be only buried. And so we had resorted to this new design, which we call home-based newborn care, not hospital-based newborn care, but home-based newborn care. But both as a doctor and as a scientist, it was our responsibility that we test this very rigorously. Is it safe? Is it effective? Is it cost-effective? Is it acceptable to people? So we designed a field trial. Field trial is a sort of experiment, but you do it in large scale laboratory. And so in, in population, we selected 39 villages as our, what we call intervention villages, where this home-based newborn care was introduced through these 39 women, one per village. And 47 similar villages became our control area where regular government programs continued as they were. <clears throat> we measured baseline mortality rates in both the areas and continued to measure every year very meticulously 99% recording of births and deaths. That's what we achieved. And 
after measuring baseline which was similar in both intervention and the control areas interventions were introduced what were interventions they were very simple they were not high tech but they were based predominantly in human transactions so this is our one village health worker <clears throat> we call them arogya doot so she is arogya doot maya umargundos war from a village called again murza and maya is learning how to give health education to a pregnant woman belief system in this district was unbelievable pregnant women in general medically we advise them to eat more <clears throat> here the popular belief system was that if pregnant woman eats full belly the baby becomes big and delivery becomes difficult so pregnant women starve themselves so that the fetus will be small size undernourished and delivery would be easy it was unfortunately unfortunate but in the absence of cesarean section facility it was their life saving approach <clears throat> mother's life should be saved so here health education is being given to the pregnant women what sort of care they should take of themselves hygiene nutrition iron folic acid antenatal care tetanus toxicity food diet etc etc and after the baby was born the village health worker or the arogya doot as i said would make frequent home visits meet the mother examine the baby weigh the temperature weigh the weight uh, measure the temperature weigh the baby's weight so that she could monitor the health of the newborn baby <clears throat> babies who were born low birth weight these are twin babies from village called ambetola they are not only twin but as you can see both of them are low birth weight very thin and you can see house flies sitting there so unhygienic also very little chance of these newborn babies surviving in a usual way so how can you keep them at home we, in, there is there is no nicu so we converted those same delivery rooms into nicu a rural nicu they were kept in this kind of warm bags so that they didn't become hypothermic they were monitored regularly by the village health worker mothers were trained how to provide frequent breastfeeding keeping hygienic and if these babies developed infection that condition is called neonatal sepsis so we trained our community health worker village health worker to even diagnose neonatal sepsis and treat with antibiotics so that the most essential component of newborn care knowledge hygiene nutrition both to mother and to baby by way of breastfeeding maintaining temperature and antibiotics if necessary only 6% babies were required antibiotics so this was home based newborn care <clears throat> let's look at the outcome i am cutting the story short but the major test was does it reduce newborn mortality newborn mortality in public health parlance is called neonatal mortality rate <clears throat> if 1000 babies are born how many die within first 4 weeks that is called neonatal mortality rate in this graph we are seeing neonatal mortality rate in our this field trial area from 93 to 2003 10 years period the yellow line that you see is the neonatal mortality rate in control area and as you see in 93 to 95 it is 58 and with random fluctuations it has remained around 60 for 10 years and this represents really what happened in rural india in those 10 years neonatal mortality rate practically remains stagnant these intervention 39 villages you can see in the blue line baseline neonatal mortality rate was 62 and then home based newborn care was introduced and with, within 3 years it steeply came down by 98 97 98 it had come down to 26 from 62 to 26 within 3 years and then it stabilized our experiment was over but we continued as service program 70% reduction as compared to the control area this was phenomenal 
our hypothesis actually was the trial was designed to detect 25% reduction in mortality. Unexpectedly, we had huge reduction, 70%. And the infant mortality rate, which is, you must have heard it, very commonly used word, that up to one year of life, how many children die out of 1,000 born? <clears throat> so here you can see in Gadichurli, it was originally 121. Initially, we introduced pneumonia treatment, which I didn't dis discuss today because time is short. And then we introduced home-based newborn care. With these two simple village-based interventions by training community health workers, the infant mortality rate in Gadichiruli reduced from 121 to the level of 30. And incidentally, this 30 as the IMR was selected by Government of India as the national goal to be achieved in the next 10 years. Gadichuli villages had already achieved it. This is very dramatic. Gadichuli still continued to remain poor, backward, remote, without health care, without access to hospital care. But who, who did this miracle? This is same Kajubai, which you saw earlier, but 20 years later, her, her hair has great. <clears throat> These are the equipments that she carries in her bag for newborn care, for pneumonia treatment. And uh, this bag with uh, nearly two pound or one kilogram weighing equipments and records with that bag on her shoulder, with knowledge in her head, with skills in her hands and with compassion and motivation in her heart. This Arugya Dut can go from home to home and she can convert any home, any home delivery room into practically into rural NICU. She is a mobile NICU. And it is this kind of trained community health worker and mothers together made this difference. So this is our symbol of home-based newborn care. These Indian homes and huts, crores of them are dark. The mother was helpless there with sick babies. Every year, 2.6 crore newborn babies are born in India. But you open that one window, window of knowledge, window of access, window of empowerment of community health worker. And then mother become, the women in the village become empowered to take care of themselves and their babies. So this is essentially an empowerment model. Individuals, communities, women can be empowered with knowledge and little technology and some supervision and support so that they can take care of themselves and their. And as I showed you the outcome results, that in a control trial, it proved to be successful beyond our expectation. The Lancet, probably number one medical journal world over, not only published it in 1999, but subsequently it selected this paper, research paper on home-based newborn care as one of the milestone papers ever published in 180 years history of the Lancet. So it, the, it, 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 it became very accepted globally as a scientific method, scientifically proven method to reduce newborn mortality. We, we conducted repeated such cycles of trials in different parts of India with the collaboration with the Indian Council of Medical Research. Evidence from everywhere was that yes, it is feasible. People accept this kind of care at home. Large 70, 80, 90 percent of newborns in villages can be provided care with this approach and it saves lives. So government of India selected this and made a national program of home-based newborn care based on Gadichili model. We were asked to provide training to 9 lakh ASHAs. I hope you know ASHA. ASHA is accredited social health activist. She is a kind of village woman you saw Kaju Bai and our community health worker. She is designed on similar model. There are 9 lakh ASHAs in India today working in rural areas. We were asked to train them to provide home-based newborn care. So various kind of educational aids and methods were developed. We trained first national and state trainers and then 5,000 district trainers and through them, 9 lakh ASHAs. So today, 
nearly 1 crore newborn babies in rural india every year receive home based newborn care it is introduced in practically all states in india except in kerala and tamil nadu where of course newborn mortality rate was already very low so it was not needed there not only in india but it has reached bangladesh nepal pakistan africa bolivia nearly 80 countries in the world now use some component or some principles of home based newborn care so what is the model of healthcare which emerges from the story that i was trying to share with you one is that the healthcare model that is a question with which we have started our journey today what is how to provide healthcare to 1.4 billion people of india so the healthcare model must be appropriate to the needs and the culture of the people it must serve the weakest and the most needy newborn tribal women it should be low cost but high quality as we saw effectiveness of home based newborn care it should be accessible it should be close to their home so must be provided by community based models effective in reducing the problem as we saw in case of newborn mortality it should empower the community what is the point empowering hospitals in mumbai or empowering government and health ministry in delhi it is the people who should get empowered then only 1.4 billion people's problem can be solved and finally the model should be research and evidence based it cannot be based on pure my belief or your belief or somebody's wish so this is the kind of healthcare model that search has evolved in gadchiroli so the original qu our quest for healthcare in india was how to provide healthcare to these people this is the model now healthcare cost in india that is another part of this healthcare cost in india are about 5% of the gdp total government and private out of pocket expenditure that people make you around 5% of the gdp which is nearly i am just rounding up the figures but it is 100 dollars per capita per year but we want to imitate the model which the americans follow for us everything american is ideal i hope not donald trump but us medical care cost is 9000 dollars per capita per year and this is before arrival of covid after covid epidemic this cost would be, must must have gone up but we haven't yet measured the us healthcare cost post covid so us medical care cost are how much nearly 90 times higher than indian medical care cost and this is at parity level so american model of healthcare when i say american it really means the developed country high tech high capital intensive model of healthcare model from the west are wasteful they are impossible to sustain financially and so we need we need to provide universal health care but universal health care by medical system may generate dependence exploitation and astronomical cost as often happens in the private care model in india so the best way of providing universal health care to 1. Point, now actually 1.4 billion population is to generate universal capacity to care for health giving universal capacity which means capacity to everybody to care for health will ensure that there is a universal health care in india and you need a village health team with about six community health workers you saw one kajubai for maternal newborn child health but then there are other problems, there are malaria, tuberculosis, now COVID has arrived, malnutrition, family planning, sanitation, now high blood pressure, diabetes are increasing in villages. So there is a need for two community health workers per, per village. I would like to call them 
government has already called women community health worker as asha and there should be one man so he could be called ashok asha and ashok per village can become the main soldiers of healthcare we need 1 million ashas and 1 million ashoks to produce healthcare and provide healthcare to every village this will generate results far better than 10 all india institute of medical sciences which government is trying to replicate every in every state no instead of mss and where 60 70 doctors are trained and they go to either very very high tech hospitals in delhi and mumbai or they flew flew the flew abroad we need 1 million ashas and 1 million ashoks that will provide health care to everybody now the last part when i had returned in 1984 from the us after studying public health one day i had gone to delhi there is a place called gandhi peace foundation and one evening i was introduced to an old man i didn't capture his name properly at that time but he was told that this young boy abhay so and so 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 he asked me to abhay tum us se padh ke aa rahe ho public health so i said yes so he said what is indian definition of health I was flabbergasted. In my nine years medical education in India, and then subsequent public health education in the US, nobody has ever asked me this question. I blurted out WHO definition, but he brushed me aside. He said, "Old man," he said, "No, ये तो सब विदेशी मामला है. मुझे भारतीय व्याख्या बताओ हेल्थ की." I said, "Sorry, I don't know." So he said, "What is the Hindi or Sanskrit word for healthy?" I said, "Swastha." Ah, he said, "The very word swastha carries Indian definition of health. How come? Swastha. Look at the screen. Swa means self, and stha means stationed in, based in. जो स्व में स्थित है वो स्वस्थ है." जो स्व में स्थित नहीं है दूसरे पर निर्भर है दूसरे पर अवलंबित है वो अस्वस्थ है ब्यूटीफुल द वेरी इंडियन वर्ड स्वस्थ कैरीज अ पॉलिटिकल डेफिनेशन ऑफ हेल्थ हेल्थ मीन्स फ्रीडम हेल्थ मीन्स फ्रीडम फ्रॉम डिपेंडेंस फ्रीडम फ्रॉम डिसीज फ्रीडम फ्रॉम डिसेबिलिटी यू हैव टू बी स्वस्थ if that is the indian definition of health it means individuals communities must become autonomous and responsible for their own health and health care it be, it is an empowering concept of health otherwise alternative definition the western definition is everybody must have access to icu or nicu before they die do you know in the us people when they die in the last during the last 15 days of their lives the terminal 15 days period when anyway they ultimately die 25% of their life earning is wiped off in those 15 days because they are spent in icu so <laughs> that is the their concept of health we need an indian concept of health where individuals communities people are empowered to take care of their own own health how can i live in a way that i won't fall sick if i consume tobacco i will fall sick if i consume alcohol i will fall sick if i have air pollution i will fall sick if I, my nutrition is not proper if i am not exercising properly i will fall sick so a my behaviors my habits these must change and these are in my hands to a large extent similarly the community society has to change so that disease producing habits behavior substances policies they cease they reduce and if at all i fall sick i should be able to take care of myself or my family my community my village should be able to take care of myself at least 90% of the time in 10% instances maybe we still will still need doctors and hospitals 
So this is the model of healthcare, an empowerment model, swastha, atma nirbhar. I am using Prime Minister Narendra Modi's word, but it's it's a new word that he has been using. But we have been using this swastha definition. And by the way, I discovered that the old man who asked me that question, it was. life changing question that he asked me what is the indian definition of health and told me the meaning of swastha he was grandson of mahatma gandhi himself professor ramu gandhi ramchandra gandhi i accidentally met him that day but he opened my eyes to a very new concept <clears throat> and <clears throat> taking inspiration from his grandfather Mahatma Gandhi, I have coined this word, Arogya Swaraj, where health is in the hands of the people. People are empowered to take care of their own health, so they are not dependent on others. And this will be the model of healthcare. At the bottom are various social factors, social health. Then in the middle, individual and family behaviors and capacity to take care of health. and then community based healthcare kind that we saw in gadchurli and then finally a small proportion of hospital based care this kind of healthcare model is what will enable us to provide healthcare and health to 1.4 billion people of india this is the hut of mahatma gandhi in sevagram ashram from where i took all this inspiration thank you very much thank you so much sir that was thank you so much sir that was really wonderful and i think it really i, I think the crux of your story was it had really touched hearts as well as communicated so much about how much you have done in gachiroli it was really informative and i think we all have so much to learn from an inspirational figure like you so thank you so much for sh sharing your story we have a few very interesting questions for you and i'm going to start asking them now um let me begin by asking the first one uh what are the challenges that your program has faced in times of covid 19 and how have you dealt with it in gachiroli it's an interesting question covid even before covid arrived in gachiroli the fear of covid arrived okay. and i must say the fear of covid was far bigger problem than covid itself that made people initially very careful hand washing isolation etc etc but after 2 3 months when people saw that covid didn't come to gadchiroli because covid arrived in gadchiroli in september so people started relaxing it was a new disease nobody not only in gadchiroli knew but i think globally nobody knew really how to handle this problem so in that initial phase we designed the strategy knowledge is the best vaccine so in 108 villages where we worked in every village we organized covid committee committee against covid and then organized health education in the villages how covid spreads how they could take care of themselves a uh, voluntary youth groups were constituted to see that people won't cr crowd together everybody would use mask and the community health workers we have community health workers in 134 villages so they were trained to suspect covid treat mild covid in the village itself but refer more serious cases to the hospital that's how we tried to manage covid i wouldn't take credit for the success of this strategy because in general covid in india has been a mild disease so in gadchuli also we have seen similar situation a larger proportion of people the zero prevalence survey tells us 
that nearly 30% people in Gadichuli developed COVID. Okay. Which means 4 lakh people, estimated 4 lakh people develop infection. But actually those who got tested and positive were only 9,000. It means really rest of the people were so mild that they didn't come even for testing. And out of those uh, about 9,000 who were positive, case fatality has been around 1%. So I must say that Garchuli was lucky and that we probably India was lucky that we have escaped COVID largely. I don't know whether because of our measure or in spite of our measure or without our measures, but yes, we have been lucky. But that did give us opportunity to provide knowledge of how this kind of infectious disease spread, how to prevent them. So there, I, I am hoping that these gains in the rural community will be more long term. Very interesting, sir. I think lots to learn actually from every answer that you uh, present. I think we have so much to learn from you. Okay, so my next question would be, um, so we are we have been asked here, what are some policy changes that need to be implemented to improve healthcare in rural areas of India? Very good question. So to introduce policy changes, we ought to know what are the problems. Yes. So let's look at the problem at some different layers or levels. We usually look at the problem as we measure here how many people die. The worst case scenario, people die. How many people die and they die of what causes? And we find that A, of course, that the child mortality, newborn mortality at one end of life and then at other end in the old age, stroke, cancer, heart disease, hypertension, Respiratory problems, chronic pulmonary problems, these are the major causes of mortality. In children, malnutrition, newborn mortality, pneumonia, diarrhea, and then malaria, tuberculosis, these are the two diseases which affect really all age groups. So these are the major causes, but this is at the disease level. Yeah. If we go a little below, what are the factors which cause these diseases? So mosquito breeding places, lack of sanitation or domestic pollution. Women cook burning the biomass because they have nothing else. So that creates a lot of smoke in the hut and every child, everybody is really without even smoking BD or cigarettes, still everybody is smoking the cooking smoke. Yeah. And we know now this domestic stoke smoke is one of the major cause for morbidity mortality in India. Malnutrition, of course, everybody knows. Hypertension has become very common even in rural area. And then even the underlying of that are certain risk factors. We don't cause them, call them even causes. But these are risk factors like poverty. Use of tobacco and alcohol have emerged as major risk factors globally. So now if these are the main problems and then lack of healthcare, lack of knowledge, poverty and so lack of diet and nutrition. These are the various things. Now, obviously situation is too complex. You cannot with one policy or one solution, you can you cannot solve all this. So if I am asked, given choice, select one policy. I would select policy of empowerment. Swastha. Empower every individual, every community so that they can take care of their health. In Garchuli, a silent revolution is occurring. Out of 1500 villages, 800 villages have completely stopped alcohol in their villages. And 300 villages have stopped tobacco sale in their villages. This is the empowerment model. We call this campaign as Mukti Path. How to liberate villages from tobacco and alcohol. Otherwise, you treat cancer after and then spend huge amount of money. But tobacco causes cancer. So we need policies which address these all different levels. Policies which address disease, policies which address the causes of disease, and policies which address the social determinants of disease. 
and most important, empowering individuals and community for our own guests for our age. So that uh, that was very insightful, actually. Like you mentioned, like you broke it down very uh, beautifully, I would say. And uh, like you said, if you had to choose one, it would be the po policy of empowering individuals to take their own, to, to take healthcare into their own hands, which is wonderful. Um, so the next question that we have for you here is, uh, Vishwali has said, thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Dr. Bang. How do you see technology helping in rural settings? Do you think sensors help in determining how uh, newborns get affected, thereby accelerating healthcare? Do you think technology plays an important role in, you know, uh, helping or empowering individuals to take healthcare in their own hands? It's an excellent question. And uh, if there is something which is a game changer, look, poverty reduction might take a few decades. Several other things might take air pollution, to reduce air pollution might take even longer. But technology can make very rapid changes. And just for example, let me begin with simple technology of hand washing. Now, because of COVID, it has become very popular now, but our Arogya Dutes have been spreading hand washing even much earlier. Because the newborn babies developed infection some of that infection is carried through hands, hands of the mother, hands of the caretaker, caretaker. And so technology by way of imparting knowledge, technology by way of, let's say, if you want to measure blood pressure, nearly 20% of adults in India now have got high blood pressure. All the doctors and nurses in India put together will be insufficient to measure their BP every day. So technology can make it possible yeah. either with their electronic equipment, they can measure their own BP and monitor and through teleconsultation, if necessary, they can consult their doctors. They don't have to go and queue and wait in the waiting room of doctors. So for the several problems, of empowerment for reducing this is our community health workers like Kajubai, if they are working in remote villages, imagine if they have access to tele teleconsultation, if she has a serious baby, she can immediately consult us through video conferencing. Ah, what a great thing that would be. I mean, it's not difficult now. Telecommunication and WhatsApp and whatever, like you and I are talking right now. I don't know even the distance between where you are based. No, but then we can talk on the same screen. Why not same thing happening that a sick child in a rural home and our Kaju Bai or village health worker goes and connects me to her yes. and to the baby and the diagnosis treatment could be possible. So technology is a game changer. Question is, is there appropriate technology? Yes. MRI and CT scans are great, but they are not going to reach villages of India. So how do we develop simple technology, immediate bedside diagnosis, strip method of diagnosis? How do we use mobile phones, teleconsultation, knowledge imparting to the extent later on even artificial intelligence so that on a large scale, the empowerment, self-empowerment of the people that I talked about earlier, Arogya Swaraj, actually technology is a very powerful way to enable people to become more empowered and take care of their own health in their hands. Definitely, sir. Like you mentioned, it might not be easy for, uh, you know, uh, say, uh, MRI scanners or, you know, heavy equipment to immediately reach us uh, in villages, but it is essential that uh, we use small technologies to, uh, you know, uh, empower individuals at an earlier stage. Um, I would just uh, like to ask you another question here. Just give me one second. Uh, uh, yeah, so the next question for you is, um, and I think this would be one of the uh, second last question that we'll ask you. Um, how would one make, uh, how would one empower individuals across the entire country Country. Now, this example is exclusively of Gachiroli. How can we make sure that this 
reaches all corners of india and that we don't face um healthcare issues like this all over india there are two three solutions one i already mentioned that the home based newborn care model developed here has not remained only to those 39 villages it has reached all over india so when you do science based solution search you develop solutions which are tested scientifically not always but often they they become part of the policy because even government is looking for solutions so if you come up with a solution with strong scientific evidence and with the economic model then they get scaled up and become available everywhere but then i'll add two more things one is that those who are listening to me today it is for them to become the catalyst of these solutions reaching where they are needed hmm. so it's for me the, the change must begin with myself and finally and finally if we can empower people through various modern methods of technology with knowledge knowledge is the most important medicine it is the most important vaccine it is the most empowering thing imagine a rural woman who doesn't know that my hands carry bacteria and mother's hands can kill baby by carrying infection no what game changer it would be that if she learns importance of hand washing and so using knowledge science empowering people and all of us becoming the change makers it's our responsibility science which doesn't reach where it is needed is of what use is it science cannot be for the sake of science it is good intellectual excitement but then what next so ultimately we had to we have to harness science to reach where the problems are problems are there it means we need to go there where the problems are definitely sir that was so informative i think uh, you know that brings us to the end of this session it was so lovely chatting with you uh, i think you have answered the question so patiently so thank you so much for your time i'd like to ask you one last question uh, that um, how do you think how important do you think are platforms like india science festival in order for researchers and scientists to you know collaborate with society just a quick word sir what do you think about public engagement platforms like these it's a it's a great initiative especially having dialogue with younger people and this transfer of experience information transfer of stories in the earlier days old people sitting grandfather and grandmother in the villages used to transmit that knowledge orally to their children now we are doing same thing here and so having this kind of platform which allows us share knowledge ideas stories failures and successes all this is a is a great thing but ultimately how useful it is you are going to decide later on because yeah. how useful this dialogue this exchange is that we'll know in the future definitely sir and hope this here's hoping that this dialogue that we have had with you your uh, your talk at our science festival has uh, you know here's hoping that it's inspired a lot of our, our attendees this talk is also going to be available on youtube for everybody to watch later on so again on behalf of team isf thank you so much for joining us it was such a pleasure having you and we hope to host you again at isf thank you so much sir. thank you very much thank you thank you so thank you um i would like to inform all our attendees that it is now time for our next panel discussion which is again a very interesting one we are going to talk about ancient medicine systems and their relevance in 2021 are they relevant anymore is it going to take us to a nirvana level or is it no good let's find out with our uh, panelists i would request everybody to uh, turn on their video uh 
I'm going to now hand over to Anuradha Varanasi, who is um, a freelance science journalist and has very graciously agreed to join us for this panel and is going to moderate it. She will be introducing all our panelists and taking us through this discussion. And I, I would like you all to know that, uh, you know, you can leave your comments in the Q&A box and we'll take them towards the end of the session. And uh, Anuradha, over to you. Thank you, Shruti. Um, and thank you to everyone for attending this session. Um, as Shruti mentioned, this is about, this panel discussion is specifically about uh, ancient medicine systems, uh, nirvana or no good. How do we find out? Um, so I would like to start by uh, introducing all of our panelists. Uh, we first have Professor Rama Jayasundar. Uh, she did her PhD in physics from Cambridge University in UK. Her area of specialization is uh, nuclear magnetic resonance or uh, NMR. She also has a medical degree in Ayurveda and uh, is professionally trained as an Ayurvedic doctor. Uh, she is currently head of the department of NMR and MRI uh, at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, where she has been a faculty since 1993. Uh, we then have Dr. Shantanu Abhyankar. Uh, he is an obstet obstetrician and gynecologist uh, with over 25 years of experience. And he is based in Bai, Maharashtra. Uh, he has given a TED talk for dispelling the myths of homeopathy. Uh, Dr. Abhyankar had studied homeopathy after which he decided to become uh, an allopathic doctor. Uh, thirdly, we have Dr. P. Ram Manohar. He is an award-winning Ayurvedic researcher who has worked in this field for 30 years. Uh, he is the research director of uh, Amrita School of Ayurveda, and he has traveled to over 20 countries for his research visits. Um, our fourth panelist is uh, Mr. Pulok Mukherjee. He is the director of the Institute of Bioresources, uh, Resources and Sustainable Development. Uh, Professor Mukherjee and his research group have been working on the development and chemical processing of medicinal and aromatic plants, uh, particularly on the bioprospecting of plants and their constituents. Uh, our, uh, finally, uh, last but not the least, is uh, uh, Dr. Ajit Kulkarni, he is the director at the Homeopathic uh, Research Institute in Pune. He is a veteran homeopath and has given uh, around 100 international seminars in different parts of the world. Um, it's, uh, it's incredible to have uh, all these experts here to talk to us about a subject that has... Um, been of great public interest uh, and has also been kind of controversial. Um, so I would like to start by saying that um, worldwide allopathy is uh, the most accept uh, accepted form of uh, medical treatment. Uh, it is science-based and uh, it's, it's trusted globally because it's backed up with uh, extensive scientific data. Uh, on the other hand, um, Ayurveda, homeopathy, and other kinds of uh, alternative medical practices um, are not as widely accepted. Uh, so my first question um, uh, to the panelists is, uh, and I would specifically like to direct this question to uh, uh, Professor Jayasundar and, uh, uh, and Mr. Kulkarni, uh, is that, uh, is there uh, sufficient scientific evidence that proves uh, Ayurveda and homeopathy's efficacy and safety. Um, what are some of the res uh, promising research directions in uh, both of these fields? Thank you, Anuradha. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you. So yes, it's true that allopathy is the established system and there are many questions uh, uh, raised about Ayur systems, but I think these are more out of ignorance than anything else. And these are as scientific as a modern system. We have beliefs in modern system because we are living during the time it's developing. 
and these are systems uh, like ayurveda it has developed uh, you know many thousands of years ago and uh, but there are enough uh, literature available which traces the growth of the system especially ayurveda and what kind of uh, you know uh, research went into it so it is very naive to think that you know uh, something could have survived thousands of years you know taking care of the health of the indians without an iota of science in it nothing survives if it's not a science so i think the problem that ayurveda and other ayur system face is the um, ignorance of the people and the other thing is that the proof of the pudding is in the eating right so as far as the evidence of usefulness of ayur systems proof is in the number of patients seeking the help of ayur systems and uh, getting successfully treated as well if you look at the infrastructure of ayur systems in india there are close to 4000 hospitals 8 lakh registered practitioners 914 colleges and close to 55000 students so you know i mean all these are uh, uh, form part of the evidence that the systems work whether a person is educated or not educated if a system doesn't give them the 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 relief from the symptoms and cure of the disease they will not go to it right so one doesn't have to be a scientist you know uh, for for, uh, for for these so you know it delivers that's why people turn to it but the fact is that uh, you know there is lot of lot of ignorance as well and uh, there has to be a, a awareness program on a very large scale i think in addition to what the respected speaker is talking about ignorance plus a kind of a haughtiness and dogmatism that is the way in which allopathic doctors look at homeopathy and ayurveda as far as homeopathy is concerned if you see it is regarded as the second most largest alternative therapy in the world according to the you see transparency market research new york homeopathic uh, you see product market has reached us dollars billions 18.6 and it has to increase according to the research at least 14% with corona outbreak it is likely to go beyond 20% in india itself according to ayush 53% people in india consume homeopathy so such a large area of health sector being covered by homeopathy still it is regarded as unscientific why unscientific i have a big you see research modality along with me i have a full record of the research which has been done in homeopathy i specifically bring it it is a record of all the data which has been you see done as far as the research is concerned in america in europe in india in many parts of the globe such a research has been double blind randomized individualized as far as the disease is concerned as far as the disease conditions are concerned all the scientific protocols have been followed we homeopaths are following the protocols but there are some problems also i must say if there is a camel and someone decides that elephant's leg should be now transplanted to the camel and let us see now whether camel is able to walk with the legs of the elephant he cannot walk then you are weak camel you are very weak you cannot walk you have not the capacity to walk like what we walk we have to understand ayurveda homeopathy or each homeopathic each system of ayush in its own way understanding the individuality of them understanding the modalities of them understanding their scope and limitations every therapy must be understood in these two aspects scope and limitations when it comes to ayush everyone talks about limitations why not about scope who prevents you to do research 
homeopathy didn't say no to research why it will say because it is a ailing humanity matter it is not a matter of any dogmatism homeopathy totally accepts that research is the hallmark of success it is only through the research that homeopathy will go ahead but in spite of substantial proof has been given still homeopathy is unscientific homeopathy doesn't contain any substance so it is just a placebo so are we here to again listen the same thing after 260 years of the origin of homeopathy that homeopathy is placebo i have been practicing since the last 34 years could i practice only with a placebo is it possible these are the questions these are the grievances these are the resentments which are available with the minds of several homeopaths and also ayurveda so we have to discuss all these issues today your voice is not uh, audible oh sorry uh, i was muted i would also like to ask uh, dr manohar and uh, mr pulok uh, mukherjee to share their thoughts on this yeah thank you <clears throat> to add to what has already been said you know one of the reasons why ayurveda could not be mainstreamed is also that we have not really invested enough in its development and in fact there has been a lot of obstacles you know knowledge systems evolve over a period of time the fact that as the previous you know panelists mentioned the fact that these systems have survived show that they are of benefit and that's what i wanted to point out in spite of you know extremely adverse circumstances they have survived that is a point i would like to add like our previous panelists said that it has survived and you know all these things are there i must highlight that it is under ad extremely adverse circumstances if you look at the current uh, budget uh, you know in the health systems uh, the entire ayur system is getting only less about 5% of the whole budget and within that a small fraction is given for ayurveda if you look at the colonial period ayurveda and such systems were suppressed so much that it is surprising that it is still surviving so if you want to mainstream and also it is not a question of confrontation that's also another issue we are when we when we look at these different systems we are saying it's either allopathy or ayurveda the fact that all these systems are survived indicates that as human beings uh, we need you know multiple options the the human body is so complex that one approach is not able to provide all the solutions so instead of and what ayurveda has greatly suffered is this opposition this or that i mean uh, if if we had gone on to a attitude of you know coexistence taking the best of each systems for the benefit of humanity then ayurveda and other uh, homeopathy and other systems would have got a better uh, you know treatment and better encouragement or you also ask this question about evidence not being available now i want to say that if if you don't invest in research if you do not promote research how can you create evidence this is the biggest dilemma that the our community is facing you, the, there is a big demand for evidence in modern terms and there is no investment no facilitation and then you say there is no uh, evidence being generated in ayurveda the evidence is available in a codified form in an uh, you know in our classical text they are all another form of evidence what is not available is that they have not been reinterpreted in modern terms in modern scientific terms and for that effort has to happen and in india it's not just the ayurvedic community but the entire scientific community has to contribute you know to make, uh, modernize ayurveda make it more relevant to our current society so that is what i say i am not go- i am not going to take on in this over enthusiastic note saying that ayurveda is solutions to offer for every human disease it has profound uh, you know insight into the biology of the human body that still has relevance it can address a lot of problems that cannot be approached by the uh, modern medical system that is why it is still survive but if we if it is survive if we want the system to flourish then we have to put in efforts and uh, that that i think is the way for so these are my thoughts
thank you thank you for sharing that uh, which which also uh, brings me to my next question uh, uh, do uh, do you know about uh, which treatments is ayurvedic treatment effective and where it might not be so effective is it uh, to me yes you and Hi. professor jayasundar as well yeah you know i have been involved in some interesting studies uh, and this is what i would like to point out is that uh, you know in modern terms we know that ayurveda is good in many chronic conditions especially you know when the body's immune system is weak and i have experience in uh, doing a research on rheumatoid arthritis because of lack of time i'll just focus on that and as an illustration which is a chronic inflammatory disease and for which modern medicine still does not have very satisfactory solutions and um, many of the medicines that are used have very severe side effects so in the institution where i worked earlier that is in ayurveda pharmacy coimbatu we got a chance to uh, do a very you know uh, organized scientific study with funding from the national institutes of health usa which happens to be the only nih funded study to evaluate ayurveda scientifically outside the united states and uh, this whole study was led by a very eminent rheumatologist from the us uh, you know dr daniel first i'm saying this example because there was this question what scientific evidence do we have and i want to just put this i'm not saying this is the only way to validate ayurveda but then if you put the right effort we will get good answers that's the only thing i want to highlight here so in this study you know Uh, this was a very interesting study because the rheumatologists from the us were open they were willing to look at whole system ayurveda they gave us the freedom to individualize treatment you know for each patient and still use a randomized double blind placebo controlled uh, design usually ayurveda doctors are forced to choose one medicine and then give it to all the patients the same thing that's not the way ayurveda works we understand that each patient requires an individualized approach in the study you know both the requirements of a modern scientist as well as an ayurvedic physician were more or less you know satisfied that is what makes the study very unique and at the end of the study we found that this is a pilot study that is a limitation but it the trend clearly it was indicated that at nine, at 6 months ayurvedic treatment was not as effective as you know methotrex said the standard of care but at the end of 9 months the respondent 70% improvement the maximum respondents were in the ayurveda group with fewer side effects and this study because of its study design it got published in the annals of rheumatic diseases which is the number one you know journal for rheumatology in the world highest impact factor and edzard earns a very vehement critic of complementary and alternative medicine who usually criticizes anything that is related to camp he wrote a commentary on our medicine which is the first and last time he has said anything positive about complementary and alternative medicine he recommended our study as a blueprint for future studies on camp so i'm just telling this to highlight the point that when the proper investment has been done for research on ayurveda we have been able to understand where it can contribute even in modern terms i won't say that we should do that for every uh, you know disease that ayurveda can manage but it is also possible with the right in, uh, you know investments are made this study also won an award from europe i'm just saying that because at the time when the thmbd directive was you know uh, you know formulated which what was trying to prevent systems of medicine like ayurveda from entering into europe at that time our study got an award from the european society of integrative medicine so what i mean to say is that if the right efforts are made we can get recognition even from skeptics that is what i have understood from my experience similarly for osteoarthritis a study was done at the charity medical university in the us and i mean sorry in germany and that study also showed that ayurvedic treatments are you know giving better outcomes these are done by modern rheumatologists in the us i know neurologists who have worked on parkinsons and ayurveda modern neurologists there is one paper on classifying alzheimers disease based on ayurvedic understanding so anyway for lack of time i think i will not go further but this is just you know just some glimpses of you know where ayurveda was also able to produce scientific evidence on specific areas you know where it has some strength in offering good care 
sure. Thank you. Uh, Professor Jayasundar, um, I'm also curious to know, um, you have worked in, uh, you have done a lot of research in your area. So could you tell us more about these uh, multidisciplinary areas of research that combine uh, modern methods in allopathy uh, with Ayurveda? Yeah, I think what I would also like to uh, highlight uh, is that uh, um, Ayurveda ha has a theoretical framework. It's a theory-based medicine. We are talking about a system of medicine which has collected evidence, observed, which has documented its observations for thousands of years. Right now, we are talking of big data. Now, so Ayurveda has huge data documented uh, uh, very rigorously over thousands of years. These have given rise to theories. So Ayurveda has a theoretical framework, uh, which uh, you may be surprised to know that uh, modern medicine does not have a theory. There is no theory of health and disease, which is why every new disease has to be researched into in modern medicine. So if it's, a, if it's a COVID virus, then you know one needs to do research. If it's a multiple sclerosis, one needs to do re research. If it's a rheumatoid arthritis, we need to do research. But Ayurveda has a theory. So the advantage of a system of medicine, which has a theory, is that one does not require priory knowledge of all the diseases. So this is like, you know, uh, we study uh, theories or, you know, like, simple addition, subtraction, and multiplication and division in primary school. It's a theory of addition, theory of subtraction. So you need not know all the problems prior uh, to be able to use these very simple theories, right? So you can be given any problem and you apply these simple theories and do the mathematics, right? So that is the advantage of Ayurveda. It doesn't matter whether it is COVID virus, Corona, or it doesn't matter whether it is multiple sclerosis, it has a theoretical framework and it has, uh, uh, so any new disease can be diagnosed on its own parameters. So one should have clarity of thought on this because just like you, know, you cannot understand physics in terms of chemistry, chemistry in terms of biology, biology in terms of physics, right? So every uh, subject has its own focus. So the same subject matter can be studied from a different point of view from physics and chemistry. Physics will talk about forces between particles, whereas you know, chemistry will talk about how the molecules are arranged or rearranged to form new substances. So same way, the human system is the same, but Ayurveda has a different perspective. Hence, it uses a different terminologies. I'm not talking about the language. It doesn't matter whether one is in English, one is in Sanskrit, right? So even if you try the translate the understanding of you no know, uh, associated with the Sanskrit words, it would make sense in English, right? So allopathic, the allopathy system has a reductionistic viewpoint. There is nothing right or wrong about it. Let me make it very very clear. That is it, it the way it has developed. Ayurveda has a very different viewpoint, which is why its diagnostic parameters, the metrics it uses, they are all very different. So if one needs evidence for Ayurveda, it has to be done on its own parameters. So if we go to a physics lab, you have to follow the rules and regulations and terminologies of physics. You can't go to a physics lab and say, I will do it like a chemistry, right? So when we talk of multidisciplinary areas of research, from a scientific curiosity point of view, I mean, there are umpteen research areas, you know, which as a scientist, it would be very, I would be very curious to look into. But here we are talking of a system uh, which we are looking up to in terms of delivery for healthcare, right? So we are not trying to look at it as a science. We are trying to see because the health scenario is very, very dismal. Despite all the sophisticated uh, research uh, that's happening in modern medicine, sophisticated technologies that we have to look at very nuanced aspect of the human system, the diseases are only on the increase, right? So it is a very, very paradoxical situation. On one hand, we have uh, uh, so much investment in science and research, 
research and development. And on the other hand, we see an increase, the very dismal health scenario. So we are looking at Ayurveda uh, to deliver what it can deliver to the healthcare. So when we talk about that context and the research that's needed, we need to be very, very clear in it, in our objectives. So do we need to do research uh, to improve the, the treatment, to better the treatment, or do we need to do research to prove our systems to the rest of the world? Now, we need to have clarity on this objective. If we want to do research to prove ourselves to the rest of the world, what we should do is entirely different. If we want to do research to improve, to deliver better to the patients, what we need to do is entirely different, right? So, so we need to know, we need to know what, what is it that we want to do. Then only we can uh, decide how we want to do the research. Sure. Uh, and Dr. Bianca, I, um, I'm very curious to know, uh, after hearing these very diverse perspectives, uh, you know, do you do you feel like uh, this could happen where uh, allopathy is not built to address certain things? It could, uh, some solutions could be taken from traditional medicine, um, or, or do you feel like traditional modern, uh, traditional, like the conventional way of uh, treating as it's done in allopathy is the only way to go? Uh, un unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Anuradha. Uh, nothing of what I've heard till now was unexpected. This is the usual uh, argument that has happened so many times. To begin with, let me make a correction that uh, I, and I believe that everybody else on this panel should desist from calling the current conventional medical practice as allopathy. Allopathy was a bad word coined by the founder of Omvati, Dr. Samuel Honeyman, to, as, as a derogatory word for the then prevalent medical practices, which were condemnable, of course. They had bloodletting, they had purgatives, and so many other practices, which were prevalent then. And people believed in those practices because they were there for a very, very long time. So this survival bias was very much present in Dr. Honeyman's days, and it was this survival bias that he fought and he thought of a different way of treating patients. He got some success for some time, though the objections that he raised against the prevalent practices were very correct. The alternative that he suggested was absolutely wrong. I'll come to that. So the, my point is that we must call the present practices as modern medicine, call it evidence-based medicine, call it science-based medicine, but never call it allopathy. It is not allopathy. By allopathy, what is meant is you do the exact opposite of whatever is happening without trying to find out the cause. That doesn't happen um, in modern practice. Like if you have headache, your treatment could vary right from a complicated brain surgery to tooth extraction to correction of your glasses to so many other things. So that doesn't happen. So first of all, a correction as to that. Secondly, we are talking about ancient medical systems. And let me tell you that the modern medicine that we practice today is nothing but the best of all the ancient medical systems from all across the world. The drugs that I use every day, I'm an obstetrician, I use oxytocin, pitocin, I use methargen. Sometimes I use digitalis. I, when patient is under general anesthesia, I use choline, which is a muscle relaxant. I use atropine. So all these drugs are once upon a time were herbal medicines, they were herbal extracts. And that is how they have come into medical practice. Quinine, which was that is hydroxychloroquine, one of its uh, uh, you know, modern uh, uh, chemical, it was also thought of as a useful drug for COVID. Quinine was the drug which started, gave Dr. Hanuman the idea of homeopathy. So that is, that is currently used as an anti-malaria drug, even by modern medical practitioners. So it is not that modern practice says that something that is made in the laboratory is the correct thing to do. And something that is traditional is wrong. But at the same time, whatever the tradition, wherever it comes from, east, west, north, south, the criteria of safety and efficacy have to be the same. You cannot have a different set of standards for certain practices and a different set of standards for different practices. It is just not done. Just as 
mathematics remains the same whether you are in korea or in russia or in america or in india so also physics and chemistry it is it goes without saying that biology also remains the same if somebody said that e is equal to mcq you know if the north korean dictator was supposed to say this nobody would be afraid of his atomic weapons so across the board anatomy and physiology should remain the same it is the same our ancestors had many different ideas about anatomy and physiology and traditions across the world have their own idea you know there is a traditional school of thought which says that the ear itself has so many points which indicate which are related to different organs in the body and then there is acupuncture then there is this kapha uh, vata pitta of ayurveda and the famous homeopathic theory of miasms you know sora syphilis psychosis and tuberculosis and things like that so these were the ideas prevalent then but then we must vet these ideas even modern medicine as we see it today it began with the idea of four humors there was the bile the phlegm the blood the black bile yellow bile the, they, those were the four humors so these ideas were prevalent then but then modern textbooks of physiology entertain none of these ideas so it has to be and because you get your anatomy wrong you get your physiology wrong obviously you get your pathology and your pharmacology wrong certainly ayurvedic medicines are very useful and as uh, the two honor, honorable panelists have already pointed out if you do meticulous research and prove these medicines they'll be of great help to all of us but then what they have said is very correct that the research should be very proper and meticulous it should be acceptable you cannot have a different research standard for ayurvedic medicines a different research standards for homeopathic medicines and a different research standard for in everything else it just cannot be done. the chinese herbal medicine artemisur which is uh, uh, currently used as an anti malarial is a traditional chinese herb you see that homeopathy i would single out as not just a, you know a, a wrong in everything it is not just anti science it is pseudo science it has got no theoretical basis if you accept the theory of homeopathy the whole theory of physics and chemistry that you accept is toppled head over heels so there is no scientific basis for homeopathy the homeopathic drugs do not contain any tangible molecule they talk of memory of water which is just a fancy idea that's what it is all homeopathic drugs beyond a certain dilution 23x and uh, 13c to be very specific i don't think the audience will follow what exactly i'm saying but beyond a certain dilution limit they cross the avogadro number and there is not a single molecule of the active agent in this particular so called homeopathic medicine so homeopathy is placebo for sure ayurvedic medicine as the honorable panelists have said they have active ingredients and we need to study them the point is that if i have to introduce a drug which i am supposed to use as a drug for modern medicine the drug has to undergo phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 trials and everybody knows what these trials are because it's been discussed over and over again due to this covid epidemic no such stringent requirements are necessary for ayurvedic and homeopathic medicines this in fact is the problem where such requirements made compulsory by law i am sure that people will invest in ayurvedic like the panelists said that yes more investment and more research needs to be done but where do the funds will come from unless there are stringent requirements in the law nobody is going to invest because i can just conjure up any drug and sell it as anti this or anti that or immunity booster or this or that so no evidence is required apart from the fact that something needs to be mentioned in some ancient text that is all that it is and in fact such provisions should be fought against it is the 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 leaders in these faculties they should demand that stringent requirement should be put in place before the drug is marketed that is the problem with these uh, systems finally madam mentioned that uh, modern medicine has no theory of its own madam i would uh, certainly like to differ modern medicine has a well defined has created a definition of health there is a very well known who definition of health there is a practical definition of health modern medicine looks at each particular disorder from a, what is called as the epidemiological triad 
agent, host, and environment. Then there are five levels of prevention, right from primary prevention to rehabilitation. So it's a wide spectrum which modern medicine covers. So please don't misunderstand me, but then there is a very well-established, well-thought-out theory of looking at wellness and illness in the practice of modern medicine. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Abhyankar. I also want to ask you that uh, there's right now a lot of uh, misinformation uh, and a lot of uh, harmful myths that are, uh, you know, um, going viral in India. Uh, it seems that there is this eroding trust in uh, in medicine and uh, the healthcare system on a whole. Uh, it was present before the pandemic, and this pandemic has aggravated it. Uh, what do you think doctors uh, and researchers in India can do uh, to to make people believe in science and believe in uh, in healthcare and modern medicine again? Uh, well, actually, I don't think that people should believe in something. I would say that rather people rather be convinced of some some particular mode of uh, treatment. Okay, the the very fact that the average lifespan of the Indian, which was somewhere around, you'll be surprised to know this, 37 years in 1947 when we gained independence, has now gone to 30, 67 years. That is the average Indian lifespan. Now, what has made all this change? It is because of better sanitation, better nutrition, education, and so many other factors, apart from the uh, better networking amongst the health services. So we have already seen uh, good outcome through this particular outreach. In fact, I would say that most of the violence against doctors happens against doctors of modern medicine. And this is so because people believe that modern medicine has a solution to all their problems and they have an excellent solution, a final solution, a good solution where success is guaranteed 100%. That is the myth. And that is why violence against doctors is usually directed for doctors against uh, doctors practicing modern medicine. So that is the that is the trust that modern medicine has generated. Though people have a mis, uh, misinterpreted the whole idea. That is how I, I would put it. Uh, which also brings me to my next question. Uh, there's so much paranoia now around. Is my immune system strong enough? Uh, in the news is coming every day that. Uh, Indians are taking these Ayurvedic medicines and uh, I have heard as a health reporter there have been cases of uh, uh, of people who have uh, suffered from heavy metal toxicity because they took some Ayurvedic medicines. They, did, they might have not bought it from uh, a reliable source, a reliable vendor. How do, uh, how do you deal with that as a, as a medical practitioner? Is that for me? Yes. <laughs> I am a gynecologist. I hardly see any patients of any such heavy metal toxicity. But then, of course, I have read and heard about it, just as you have, that there are cases reported from time to time of heavy metal poisoning. That is the whole idea. That is why each drug should be tested for safety and efficacy with stringent modern medicine standards. Standards as practiced in the modern lab. You see so many modern drugs. You know, There is something called as post-marketing surveillance. Well, the COVID, COVID uh, immunization is going on, vaccination is going on from today on a large scale. Now, it could so happen that maybe a few months down the line, we realize that one particular vaccine, one particular batch is not good enough. And we may have to withdraw the vaccine. Now, don't take this as a defeat of modern medicine or modern science. In fact, that is how modern science works. There are so many drugs that have been withdrawn from the market. May I ask my were the panelists that can you name any particular ancient medical drug which has been withdrawn for the market because some particular problems have been found. If no such drug has been withdrawn, there are two things. Either that the problems are not there, which is very, very unlikely from whatever anecdotal reports that you quoted, Dr. Mr. Anuradha. But the second thing is that there is no mechanism to monitor these problems. Post-marketing surveillance even pre-marketing research is not a must and post-marketing surveillance is also not a must. There is no system of post-marketing surveillance as far as homeopathic and Ayurvedic medicines are concerned. 
So you can see how unsafe these practices could be for the general public. Uh, I, I I would like the other panelists to also comment on this. Um, how uh, how can we standardize uh, Ayurveda in India so that there are no such uh, issues of uh, people getting poisoned unknowingly by these medicines? Uh, how can we uh, improve the quality of medicines in the market? Um, and what, what solutions do you think will work? As far as homeopathy is concerned, Standardization according to the American, European, and Indian pharmacopoeia is a part of the system developed in India. Every drug that is produced in India in homeopathy is by the way of standardization. It is not that you collect some medicine and say that it's a medicine. It has to go through several phases of research. For example, we have Central Council for Research on Homeopathy, the government of India undertaking. It has an integration with Ayush. And there are 22 centers in India related to drug proving. Of all drug proving, which have been reproved under controlled randomized double blind control studies, and also new drugs, which are with again the same research methodology. So naturally, after we get this data, from the several healthy volunteers, there is a collection of the data. Then we apply it at the clinical level. This is called as a clinical verification data. And then it comes into the Materia Medica of homeopathy. Now, this Materia Medica being grown up and is growing up at large through several sources. It is not that homeopathy totally says that it is not a uh, method of uh, something like a science. Second thing very important is that while we are trying to do the research, we must understand that research cannot be done in Ayurveda or in homeopathy at the level of abandoning the very theory and the philosophy of them. I mean to say that homeopathy is based on individualization. So naturally, when a drug is there, we, according to the law of similars, which is the very basis of homeopathy, and I think every homeopathic, allopathic, Ayurveda, any physician must understand that the very basis of the therapy is the curative principle, being told by Hippocrates, being told by Paracelsus, being written in allopathic pharmacology, being written in Ayurveda, that law of similars is the fundamental natural curative principle. So if homeopathy follows that, if Ayurveda follows that, if allopathy follows that, what is the problem in calling homeopathy as unscientific? This is point number one. And I repeat again, research in homeopathy cannot be outside the domain of individualization. Ayurveda, homeopathy, alternative systems focus on individual as a unit, mind body as a coordinate system on which they work. It is not that uh, a frog uh, experiment is done and the hypertension of the frog is reduced with this medicine and you have a chemical drug in allopathy which you can use on human beings. Of course, there are trials, I understand. In homeopathy also, there are a lot of trials being done on, you see, cardiovascular diseases, in uh, hypertension, in diabetes mellitus, by rigorously following the criteria. And the results are very good. Results have shown that many homeopathic drugs act as hypoglycemic. But you have to understand that because it is hypoglycemic, I will give the remedy to a patient is not the limited reductionist approach of homeopathy. Homeopathy will try to understand the human being in totality. So that concept of the totality of diathesis of constitution is the very basis. You cannot say that what pitta and cough are wrong concepts. You cannot see them under microscope. I will give you a very good example of uh, Einstein. He fell in love with a lady, Farah. He was always talking about experiments and everything. And his friend understood this. And Einstein told, I have a love with Farah. The friend asked Einstein, can you prove it? Have you any microscope to fool it, to show it? You see, everything cannot be explained under microscope and with the crude materialistic mechanicist ideas. Can you show your emotions to me under microscope? Is it possible? 
you can see the consequences of this similarly to call homeopathy placebo is a big joke today even after 260 years you can't understand the energy you can't understand what happens to the dynamic entity of human beings of organism whose base of life is not only materialistic but dynamistic based on energy we are here only because we have a pran when we leave the pran we have no energy in the body we become dead this is the concept with ayurveda this is the concept with homeopathy this is the concept with all the alternative therapies which work at the energy principle whole life whole universe is nothing but an energy so by saying homeopathy as placebo we are just discarding the whole basic concept of the energy there are two processes of this universe matter and the energy when we you see make a division of the uh, molecule ultimately these are only spirals of energy which are revolving so what is the basis of the matter energy so if homeopathy uses the energy principle which is a basic theme of the life as such why to call it as a placebo and there are enough studies on homeopathy that homeopathy is beyond placebo all kinds of studies have been done human studies have been done in vitro studies are there in vivo studies are there many animals have been used in order to show whether homeopathy is placebo or not so what a homeopath should do now still he is only using avogadro beyond so nanotechnology is based on something which is very very minute yeah. our belore a scientist from uh, tata atomic research has more than 50 research papers given to show the relationship between nanotechnology and homeopathy if you know khuda baksh is a researcher in microbiology he presented 100 papers how the homeopathic remedies beyond have got the number work his research is outstanding which is followed in many universities in the world so how long we will again affix affix this one to us it is a placebo and it is not our job no scientist job why homeopathy works yeah, so sure. let the scientist come forward who we have not prevented the scientist sir sure. yeah thank uh, you that uh, very quickly uh, dr mukherjee has also joined us so yeah okay yeah thank you thank you dr mukherjee uh, so one last question before we'll take uh, the audience question uh, which which is just that um, i i would like to ask this to uh, to mr mukherjee and uh, uh, professor jayson there or anyone else who would like to answer it uh, do you see any scope of like uh, medical doctors working with uh, with ayurvedic uh specialists with ayurvedic doctors uh, is there any way that uh, both of them could like work together to find uh, scientific uh, solutions to uh, to certain problems should i take this question first uh yeah see uh of course you know uh, the the interest is common right so whether whichever stream of medicine uh, the person is trained in the interest is to treat the patients and cure the disease and uh, so there is a complete consonance on that so there is no reason why uh, they should not be able to work together in fact they should work together so that the best is given to the patient and uh, but that said what is important is that there is respect for each other system and there is understanding while uh, if we take the example of a modern medical doctor i don't like to use the word modern medicine because it's it it's sounding as if ayurveda ayur systems of antique medicines right ayurveda is being used contemporarily right so it is also a modern medicine what is used in modern time is modern medicine and i don't like to use the word scientific medicine because ayurveda is scientific as well right so anyway so the thing is that while a ayurvedic doctor should understand why and how modern medicine or the conventional medicine is uh, understanding 
uh, health and disease, the same way the, the modern medical doctor should also understand. So the, the problem now, problem generally is that uh, there is already an assumption and presumption that you know the Ayush systems are not scientific for the simple reason that they they uh, developed during ancient times. So you know, I mean, as a, a physicist, um, I can tell you that you know technology doesn't make anything scientific. Technology itself is a result of science, right? So there are, uh, you yes, know, the uh, subjects, there are subjects like, you know, um, theoretical physics, theoretical chemistry, mathematics, where, uh, you know, no experiments are done. So whether a su subject is scientific or not depends upon whether there is a logic in it, whether it produces, gives you reproducible result, whether it is explainable to another person in a logical way. So that's what makes something scientific. So, so I think major problems, so I would say that, you know, as far as Ayurvedic doctors are concerned, they have a decent amount of knowledge of how the modern medicine work. Because it's, it's, it's the mainstream of medicine and we all have grown up with it. And we all are, we all have some basic understanding and all, everybody appreciates the research and, you know, development that goes in it, the scientific background it has. So, you know, that as far as the Ayush systems doctors are concerned, that is, they have understanding and appreciation of that. But the problem comes with the other side. There is no appreciation of the fact that how these systems work. So it is very naive to think that there is only one way of looking at a system. So if you take the number two, you can say one plus one is two, or 1.9 plus 0.1 is two, 1.8 plus 0.2 is two. So there is many ways to look at one system. And if you talk of uh, Ayurveda, uh, human system, it's such a complex system. There is so much complexity in it. So there is more than one way of looking at it and that's what these systems do. So when your perspectives are different, the, the how you handle it will also be different. So when we talk of a complex system, there are two things in it. One is how do you manage a complex system? The second is getting information about the components which make up a complex system. So what modern medicine does is it, the strength of modern medicine is understanding the nuances of the components which make the complex system. But this knowledge alone is not enough to handle a complex system. What Ayurveda does is it knows how to manage a complex system. So it manages the system taking into account the physical, physiological, psychological and the subtler aspects of existence. So it knows how to manage. The fact is that it does not have the nuanced exp uh, explanations you know, at the level of molecule and uh, you know genes or whatever, right? And this is the strongest fault of modern medicine. So these are two different ways of looking at the system. One has very nuanced science-based understanding. The other knows how to manage it, right? It has its own parameters. It has its own scientific uh, theoretical framework. How do you bring these two together? So the knowledge from each of these should be pulled in together and the, it should go as a benefit to the patient. So the, I see huge scope for the doctors to work together, provided every system of practitioner has an open mind, has a scientific mind, and it is not right to say that thing that only modern medical doctors have a scientific bent of mind, all the others are unscientific. I think it's a very, very, uh, it's, I feel very, very sorry to hear this. It should not, whether he's an Ayurvedic doctor or a modern medical doctor, homeopathy, I think scientific bent of mind is a must. And uh, if we shed our prejudices and wrong assumptions and presumptions and come together, I think India can be a leader for the entire world uh, to show how to, uh, you know, uh, address the health healthcare, 
and you know india is in a very advantageous position because no other country in the world has so many alternative systems we have ayurveda we have yoga we have yunani we have siddha we have homeopathy we have savaripa so i mean the the medical tradition is so huge and i think we should uh, we should see how to make use of it sure. for the benefit of the mankind definitely for human kind yeah uh, right we got one question from one of our uh, uh, attendees which is that uh, in allopathy there are uh, you know many life saving drugs so uh, are these type of drugs uh, available in uh, the ayush system because uh, uh the indigenous system is known to take like a long time to find uh, to find the cure um could we please request uh, dr mukherjee to take the question yes please okay uh, good evening everybody uh, uh, i'm so happy uh, to be here uh, i was just hearing about all the uh, comments by other panelists Uh, let me tell that i am neither a ayurvedic doctor nor a uh, modern medicine allopathic doctor i am a pharmacist by profession but i love herbal medicine so i work on that particular area of uh, phytochemistry phytopharmacology and drug development from medicinal plant resources i was working at jadavpur university at the school of natural product studies and very recently i have joined as the director of the Uh, Institute of Bio Resource and Sustainable Development at uh, uh, IMPHOL, uh, which is having another four uh, center and nodes in uh, Sikkim, Silong, uh, and in uh, Mizoram as well. So uh, my perspectives on the first, uh, let me be uh, clear uh, that what I what really attracted me to work in this area that will give answer to many of the questions what you are asking for. Say uh, I believe in uh, only that pathy which cure my disease uh, with uh, say like effectively uh, that is the best pathy. It can be allopathy, it can be homeopathy, it can be whatever. Uh, but the, the the thing is now now say like in our country say if you think about the uh, situation in Ayurveda specifically. Uh, uh, So before the British, so well uh, the, the the British came, then only that modern medicine came into existence. So before the British, we are depending on that. Now after the British influence, our modern our own medicine became alternative, and we came up with the modern medicine like allopathy as our main system of medicine. So this is some way pathetic, I should say, because we have not done much research or we have not done converted our own system to the way the whole world want when. comparing so we are talk many of the panelists was talking about the chinese drug development or the scenario uh, specifically uh, so if you think that they have tcm has really compared on that particular context but i am against that using that alternative that particular terminology for our ayurveda or or our own herbal system or even that system whole system of ayush means ayurveda yunani siddha homeopathy swarikpa what is being practiced or for years together and which has its own origin and in fact those are the system by which we were living before british and we are still living rather we are developing lot of drugs out of that and if you think about this present corona uh, covid situation itself you see that what this was a hypothesis that i do not have a scientific proof on that we are working on it So this is the northeastern uh, part of India was less affected. One of the reason what we saw because of the use of their medicinal plant in the uh, as a fermented food and others. So I believe that food as medicine, the concept what the whole Asian continent they uh, perceive, this is very much clear in our Indian context. And Ayurveda is one of the major. Uh, uh stakeholder in that particular context and definitely homeopathy and other system also has contributed a lot so here we, if we talk about the science yes there may be that 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 much of uh, uh, scientific intervention was not there but it is being done to a high extent now with the involvement of ministry of ayush in very very different way 
here one thing that if we consider about the uh, drug discovery and development program so there are two approach one is the synergistic approach one is the reductionist approach if you consider the reductionist approach by that way we have got aspirin taxol then this artemisinin and the recent uh, anti malarial drug and in but you see that those are all came from the tradition but how many of single molecular drug we have got from tradition if you go to ayurveda we have over 2000 specific medicinal plant or classical formulations what are available which are being practiced from year together the thing is that and and their efficacy is well proven so here synergy need to be studied and this and by that we can establish the mechanism as well and when you work on the synergistic concept on which we have been working for years together we have to know what are the chemicals present there but always it is not the target that there will be active constituent which is working there are several constituents together which is giving the activity and that is the thing that is the main science which need to be proven and lot of work is going on now in fact our group we have been working on that particular context as well and what i believe that those synergy together is really giving lot of benefits for ayurvedic research and which are being nurtured by several ayurvedic researcher modern medicine researchers to a high extent for developing drugs from ayurveda i'll give you uh, one uh, uh, example on that particular context uh, the the methodology what has been say like uh, if we go on the modern medicine drug development we are synthesizing a drugs and then we are going for uh, its toxicity study clinical trial and so on but in ayurvedic drugs we know the clinical use of the drugs from years together and just we are validating its chemistry and other analytical profile to establish as a drug so developing drugs from ayurveda ayurveda or traditional resources is easier than developing a drugs in the modern medicine route so this is so this much great potential what we have yes, and 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 we must nurture on those particular context now you consider about the very uh, uh, i should not say very recent but a recent concept on the personalized medicine so if we consider ayurveda personalized medicine concept in ayurveda was existing thousands years back for the same disease uh, diagnostic parameters like uh, whatever the doctor is observing one patient was getting one medicine another person was getting another medicine because of the uh, kapha pitta and other characteristics now but the science on that particular context need to be and it is not that we are lagging behind and we are not doing science on that ayurveda has less science or homeopathy has less science in things are progressing to a extent yes we need to expedite it and a government of india through the ministry of ayush has been working a lot in different different contexts and say i am working under the ministry of science and technology under department of biotechnology and we have the phytopharmaceutical mission where we are targeting on that and i want to tell you one thing very interesting that so there is say india is the only country in the world which are having very specific two drug development scenario one is the ayush route you can get a drug in the phytopharmaceutical mission route you can get a drug and this phytopharmaceutical mission phytopharmaceutical has come up very recently no other country has such a, such a thing so even if you are talking for life saving drugs ayurveda yes i i i i am not ayurveda chari i cannot explain on that particular context but there are so many things which are saving your life to a high con- high extent uh, which which has not been rather uh, promoted to that way which was supposed to be sure. thank, thank you thank you very much so much mr mukherjee uh, uh, so we we will need to wrap it up now um but but i would but i would like to know if uh, anyone might have any Uh, from from the attendees, if they might have any questions. Um, Anuradha, I think uh, what we'll do is we'll take in a list of all the questions and then email them uh, to our uh, panelists so that you know we can have some sort of um, extra information that comes in, and then we'll make it public on our social media platform, saying this is what the panelists have had to say. um i am really sorry that we have to wrap up right now because our next ev- event is scheduled for 8 o'clock and we will need to proceed on to the next one but on behalf of team isf thank you so much to all our panelists for joining us here it was a very enriching conversation very interesting to know all your perspectives definitely something uh, more uh, 
that we need to know about, more that we need to discuss about. So uh, thank you so much on behalf of Team ISF, Professor Jaisundar, Dr. Kulkarni, Dr. Mukherjee, Dr. Abhyankar, and Dr. Ram Manohar. Thank you so much for joining us. And Anuradha, thank you for wonderfully conducting the entire panel discussion. It was a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Indian scientists. Thank you, Anuradha. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that was a very, very interesting panel discussion. And, um, you know, our next talk is scheduled for uh, 8.15, which will be all about hacking and AI, which is very, very e exciting. And I'm sure all of you are interested to know more about it. But uh, before we uh, go on with the talk, we have a very interesting uh, session lined up for you. It is one of our finalists for, from our science fiction writing competition who is going to be presenting her uh, story, uh, her entry to all of you. Anjali, thank you so much for joining us and congratulations for making it to the finale of the Spin Your Science Science Fiction Writing Competition. It was fantastic. Your entry was really great and it has made to, uh, you know, the top. Uh, seven entries that have made it to the final. So well done on that. And uh, without any further ado, let's begin with your presentation. Great. Thanks so much for having me here. It's really great to see everyone. So I'm Anjali and I'll be reading out my story. It's called Little Dreams and it is a science fiction story. In the grand scheme of things, I turned up towards the end of the beginning. I heard a call. I followed a path. Had I known it would lead me here, would I have done it? To answer that question, we have to go back in time to an entirely ordinary autumn evening in an entirely ordinary sleepy small town. A butterfly was fluttering in front of my face. I was staring at it in a very sleepy manner. I was supposed to be doing physics problems, but I just couldn't seem to concentrate in the muggy heat. A voice came as if from far away. You have a letter. I forced myself to my feet with all the grace of a comatose animal. Studying, huh? Yeah, I smiled at the elderly postman. I'll give it to Papa. No, no, it's addressed to you. He pointed at the envelope. That caught my attention. I took it from him and sat down in the chair. As soon as I looked at the rain splattered sender's address, I gave a whoop of joy because it was from grandma. Ever since she had gone to that little village in the hills, we had had almost no news of her. But then that was normal with grandma. I tore open the envelope in excitement. A neatly folded paper slid out. I unfolded it and my eyes yelled in protest. The small sheet was covered with her loopy, crammed writing with blatant disregard for lines and margins and even word spacing. With a world-weary sigh, I hunkered down to decipher it. Dear Munu, how are you? How are studies? Everything's okay at school? I don't have a lot of time right now. I chuckled. She always said if people would just get to the point instead of useless floundering, the world would be a better place. The letter went on. There is something I have to do. Or rather, you have to do it for me. I suspect they know. There is another sheet in the envelope. Don't worry, it wasn't there before. You'll need it very soon, trust me. If you're reading this, it won't be much longer. If I had a choice, I wouldn't go. You know that. I feel horrible leaving everything to you. But you're smart, you'll figure it out. Know this. Whether you choose to follow through on this or not, I'm proud of you. Always will be. One last thing, don't tell your father. He is as firmly rooted in the real world as a man could possibly be. And your mother, well, she isn't as rigid as him, but you can't rely on her anymore if you do this. Love, Nani. I shook my head still in a daze. Was I reading this correctly? Had I even woken up from my nap? What was all that about? I suspect they know. And where was she going? I read the letter again. But the words hadn't changed. If anything, they'd gotten more mystifying. 
The door swung open. Ma hurried out, her cell phone in her hand. I opened my mouth to tell her about the letter, but she beat me to it. It's from the village. Grandma, she she died last night. After we traveled to the village, after I saw Papa's shoulders shaking with suppressed tears when they finally took Grandma for the cremation, after the hordes of relatives had left, after the dust had settled, after we came back, after all that happened, I finally remembered the letter. I got up from the dinner table and left. My parents did not protest. I went straight to my room. I'd been trying to pretend that it didn't exist, but it was finally time to face the music. I picked up the letter. I stared at it. And then I yelled and dropped it because the words had started glowing. What the? Right before my eyes, they rearranged themselves into new lines. I approached it as one would a wild animal, expecting it to start hissing and spitting. However, it behaved exactly how paper should. The title on the sheet was Instructions in all caps. Of course, you understand that I won't share them with you. I'm not supposed to do that. After reading it thrice, I mechanically extracted the second sheet from the envelope, the one that I could swear hadn't been there before. When this one started glowing, I didn't drop it. I just took a deep breath as the light died down, revealing a squarish metallic object, something. I didn't know what it was. It was platinum gray with short spikes extending from one surface. Otherwise, it was as smooth and polished as a diamond. The spikes were blunt. There was something written on it too. I brought it closer, peering at the strange word. It said S-A-E-N-A-D-R-A. -A -A. Huh, weird. And then I fell face forward, banging my head on the bed frame. Stars burst behind my eyes as I tried lifting my arm before promptly passing out. In my dream, I was humming and walking. Hey, I thought indignantly, that's not how it's supposed to happen. Then I realized that I was watching myself walk and hum, and that was weird enough that I got distracted for a bit. Almost too late, I realized that we'd stopped, and that the other me had turned around and was glaring at me. This was beyond awkward. I raised my hand to wave at her, but she leaped towards me, tackling me to the ground. I hit my head again, hard enough to see white and black spots in my vision. Jeez, what? I couldn't even finish my sentence before a high pitch ringing filled my ears. Someone seemed to be making popcorn next to us. I watched in shock as the other me whipped out a gun, a real looking one, and shot at something behind us. My thoughts were in a whirl, too quick to make out except an urge to run. I grabbed her arm and moved towards the building, intending to hide. While sprinting, I heard two more shots and a hissed curse as her shoe caught on something. The pavement, a stone, something. And both of us stumbled. Finally, we found cover behind some trash cans. What do you know about alternate universes? She demanded. Um, that they are universes that are alternate? My face burned with embarrassment as she rolled her eyes and muttered something about stupid 50s. Look, all I know is that my grand wrote me a letter with something about centuries and responsibilities. Silence, she hissed. She pushed me behind a nearby tree. Multiverses, butterfly effect. Does any of this ring the tiniest of bells? Uh, wasn't that the thing out of Jurassic Park? I was hallucinating. Please, please let me be hallucinating. She hugged. So many people have heard of the butterfly effect, how one flap of a butterfly's wings could cause a hurricane far away. Every flap creates a new universe where that didn't happen or happened differently, an endless collection of new timelines. What people don't know is that butterflies are not butterflies. She looked at me as if that was supposed to make sense. Well, do you remember anything? No, I said, butterflies are ancient beings, keepers of time and stewards of the multiverse. 
but there is a problem now the butterflies are dying and that is indicative of a much larger problem the extinction of universes if the reason isn't discovered and the process stopped earth could soon disappear along with quintillions of other planets so where do i come in i was curious about my role we are the sentries and we guard the gates between the universes but now everyone is dead dead but she had turned her face away but not before i caught a glimpse of the same look i had seen in the mirror since the day grandma died someone close to her had obviously left her and she was feeling it the point is that you are here for your training suddenly it was just like she resumed her talk and your gran was the one who took you for safeguarding she is dead now so you have to return what's s a e something i saw on the cube what's that oh that that's just an empire that wants to kill every sentry in existence uh, you shouldn't be very too very much concerned about it i just stared at her i shouldn't be concerned well they are probably our main enemies and then she shrugged I have to take your place in your world until you complete training and then the two of us along with some other people will have to defeat evil guys and do some crazy heroic stuff or die trying no pressures i backed away slowly but then i stopped i remembered something i'm proud of you always will be it and it was as if my grand was talking to me again you in she stared at me my parents who needed me my school my friends my entire life and the allure of the unknown i forced thank you so much anjali that was really great and i must say that you have a very great knack for storytelling so here's hoping that your uh, uh, entry makes it uh, to the final top 3 very well done thank you so much for joining us and uh, keep writing keep shining and we will now move, move on to the next talk thank you so much anjali It is with great pleasure that I welcome on behalf of team ISF Dr. Una May O'Reilly uh, who is an American computer a computer scientist and the leader at the Alpha program which is the AnyScale Learning for All program at uh, the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory uh, Dr. O'Reilly it is an absolute absolute honor for us to have you at our festival if i could just request you uh, to turn on your video Thank you so much for joining us and uh, we're very excited about your session. I just like to tell you that um, we have a majority of college students in our uh, audience today and they're very excited to hear your talk. Um you're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. and we're very excited and we'll be taking questions from the audience towards the end of your talk uh once it's done. So over to you doctor. Well, thank you very much. Let me get my settings going. Uh go to Zoom, share screen. It will be Microsoft PowerPoint. Share. All right. Uh can I get a thumbs up from someone that you're seeing my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. Um and do you see me in the top right corner? Yep, we do. Okay. I'm sure you've had to bear with that sort of question <laughs> for a long time throughout this entire festival, so thank you for your patience. Um hi everyone. Uh it's a pleasure to be here virtually. Um I would like to really thank the organizers of the Science Festival for inviting me. Uh I'm really disappointed. I couldn't uh uh, uh come to your festival personally this year. Um but you know i'm grateful for this opportunity to talk to you uh about my work and um i'm uh you know uh grateful for this chance to uh share my work with you all so i'm just fiddling a little bit with my controls here let me see if i can get them to work uh let's see 
Am I good? No, this is problematic. Let me just see if I can fix something. Uh, bear with me. Let's see. I'm expecting this, but it's covering up a lot of my text. So let's see where I can put it. What if I put it here? Okay, I'll put it here. Let's see if it'll sit here. Okay, all right. So now my settings are finally in place and I wanted to comment on my background. That's uh, the data center at uh, MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. That's where I have this privilege of working. Uh, but of course I'm locked down because of COVID. And so I'm living um, north of Boston. Um, and I wanna tell you that it's not green outside where I am. It's about three, minus three degrees Celsius. Um, and we have heavy snow, you know, overnight about six centimeters fell, wet and heavy, um, and it's continuing. So just imagine me in a completely different sort of circumstances from you, uh, but that's the uh, miracle of technology. So I'm gonna fiddle again. Let's see, all right. So what do I do? I study artificial intelligence settings that are distinctive by particular properties. Um, first and foremost, they feature adversaries who are intelligence. So in this case, you know, we have a coyote who chases continually after the roadrunner. Um, so in this study of competitors, I assume that they have these goals and they conflict with one another. Um, and the implications of that are that when these competitors actually engage, there will be an outcome. And that outcome will be in favor of one of them, um, but unfortunately the outcome will be not in favor of the other. Um, and so I'm invested in, in environments uh, where we can actually talk about one side, the defensive side as being favored. Um, and it's the good side. And the other side is out of favor or it's the bad side. So we might talk about the roadrunner is the good side here. She's defending herself. Um, and the coyote um, is the attacker uh, defending the roadrunner, the bad side. So these stylistic engagements I think about, they really occur in very complex environments. Um, and this implies that, you know, the cost to actually compete in them um, and use a strategy um, is, is, is um, high, um, but it's usually different for each side, each side, each of these adversarial sides. And uh, that means as well that they particularly, they have a common, they have goals that conflict with each other. Um, but you can actually measure for each of them how far they get in actually succeeding in their goals. Um, so I mentioned something else about these adversaries in this environment that I think about, and it's that they're intelligent, right? And so what does this mean? It means that they pursue strategies uh, that are very rich in variety, um, and they rely upon techniques that uh, achieve their respective objectives, and, and there's many of these techniques, and they're able to change these techniques um, at will. I also assume that as part of intelligence, uh, both of these sides um, are able to adapt. Um, I assume that, you know, each adversary, essentially, or each set of adversaries, each of the, each, each members of a set of adversaries is able to sort of learn um, and this learning is really kind of like at the crux of the artificial intelligence that I'm interested in. I'm, I'm interested in the fact that if an agent or, or an adversary can actually observe what happens when they engage or after they've engaged, and they can look at their outcome, they can use that information to um, replicate themselves and compete again in a better um, or more intelligent uh, way in order to actually obtain their, obtain their objective a little bit more quickly or more successfully. Um, and uh, you know, the, the interesting thing is you, if you create these environments and you assume that both sides of a competition are very intelligent and they have this ability to observe and react and uh, measure their progress towards their objectives and, and learn, what ensues from that is this uh, dynamics. And these dynamics are, you know, either could be mutually destructive, you know, it could be that the, you know, uh, one species hunts the other to extinction and then because they have no prey goes to extinction themselves. Um, or it could be that there's some sort of oscillating dynamics in terms of who has the upper hand um, in the uh, competitive uh, environment. 
Um, or it could be that really what happens is, you know, an arms race ensues. And each side actually, you know, as a result of being able to learn from what happened in the past and being forced to react to new changes on the other side, they actually ratchet up in their, in their capabilities and their strategies, and they become more and more sophisticated. And we get these sort of almost uh, intellectual arms races occurring. And all of these dynamics um, that come from this stylized setting are what's interesting to me. So returning to this uh, environment where I've shown you two uh, adversaries engaging one-on-one, -on -one, I think we have to also bring in uh, the property that it's actually an ecosystem here of adversaries um, where there's multiple competitors on each side um, and they're choosing who they're going to engage with one-on-one -on -one, um, and that may, or it may happen ra randomly or it may just be a consequence of where they are in some sort of spatial position. So the thing that, that I keep in mind is that, you know, all the adversaries of one side share the same objective, um, but often I assume that they're not working together. It would be super interesting to understand how adversaries work together to accomplish their objectives. Um, I hope to get to that one day. But right now I simplify it into thinking, well, it's a one-on-one -on -one engagement, but there's an entire um, ecosystem of uh, competitors uh, for each side. So this means that there's this scope of very, very wide behavior uh, in terms of strategies and techniques that each side can use. So that's what I'm interested in, and, and that's an introduction. So before I tell you where, you know, what are the sort of real settings where I look for the stylized setting to occur, let me just provide you with an outline of what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to start having told you about sort of a stylized adversarial intelligence, um, I'm gonna start by, by going over some examples of where we see this adversarial intel intelligence in natural settings. And maybe some of them will seem incredibly intuitive to you, but they may not be ones you would have thought of. Um, and then I'm gonna show you how we can construct a computer algorithm, develop a computer algorithm that will um, help us express uh, the processes that give rise to this adversarial intelligence and these kinds of dynamics that I've described to you. Um, and then we're gonna put that algorithm inside a software system. We call it Rivals appropriately. Um, and it's a system or a framework that my team and I have developed. And we use it to actually study cybersecurity um, and the evolution of cyber hacking, hence the title of my talk. So the first setting, uh, that we can see these adversarial intelligence um, in may not be one you would, would have come to intuitively, but I think you're going to have it, it. It's easy enough for you to agree is an adversarial setting. And that's the setting of finance and the realm of taxation. So in this uh, context, the engagement environment is the internal revenue code, right? The rules of taxation and the competition takes place over tax collection and tax payment. So in the United States, we have um, the Internal Revenue Service. There must be a, the equivalent um, government agency um, in India. Um, and they um, have to work with the fact that this code, the taxation code has unobvious hidden loopholes. Um, and with a lot of study, these loopholes can be detected um, and they can be taken advantage of in very complex ways. So what we have is one side, which is a group of um, humans um, who are, their objective is to be non-compliant with that tax code. They really don't wanna pay even though the tax code expects them to pay. Um, and what they're going to do is they need to have strategies um, that look at the tax code and find these tax these loopholes and then they need to have techniques of building financial structures transactions that buy and sell uh, that allow them to hide their assets or allow them to um, uh, feign some uh, uh, losses that don't actually exist they're going to come up with different techniques that allow them to take advantage of these loopholes um, so that the irs won't even detect that they are not paying tax um, as they should be and on the other side, we have the Internal Revenue Service. Um, and as a short-term measure, what they're trying to do is detect these non-compliant financial structures that are resulting in not enough tax being paid. Um, and particularly what these 
auditors are doing is they're seeking strategies that hide a lot of money from taxation. So both sides, the auditor side and the non-compliant evading side, they actually have access to prior use of the tax code. Um, and they also can you know, try various things and see whether they work with each other. So uh, the auditors can observe what tax has been paid, um, what tax should have been paid, <laughs> um, and they can see whether their auditing detected any irregularities. Um, and they can use that information to adapt what they do uh, the next time they actually look at someone's uh, or an entity's financial structures and, 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 and tax information. Um, and what the uh, evaders or the non-compliant actors can do is they can keep processing um, new ch changes to the loopholes or they can keep looking for ways to exploit these loopholes with various financial techniques um, that will save them lots of money so that they're not, they're, they're, despite being non-compliant, they are not paying much tax um, and they're not gonna be detected by the evaders, right? So um, what happens if you have these two sides uh, going on? And I think we do, and I think all countries do. They have you know, one side trying to collect, one side uh, trying to be non-compliant and save themselves from taxation and they make moves and they sort of have this uh, um, interactions with each other. And of course it takes place almost like in, in lockstep. Uh, you know, first what we see is there's some loopholes and uh, non-compliant uh, collection occurs, non-compliant filing occurs. But when there's changes in the auditing, um, what happens then is that the auditors are able to, the auditing processes are able to detect this and there's not many successful dynamics that I spoke about. Um, so there's really high value in this. It's a, it's a human uh, security problem um, and it's an adversarial, it's a situation with a lot of adversarial intelligence. And uh, you know, in the US, this is like hundreds of billions of dollars. So uh, this is why it's such an interesting system. Um, and in fact, uh, what I did was over the space of three or four years with my MIT research team, we developed a framework, we called it Stealth, um, and it uses artificial intelligence algorithms to model and simulate this whole setting I've told you about. You know, it takes a very, very small piece of the internal revenue code. We used artificial intelligence techniques to represent the rules of taxation um, and to um, use them to check various financial structures that we also used artificial intelligence to represent. Um, and we built a machine learning algorithm that could actually um, propose new um, financial structures that would try and uh, take advantage of, of loopholes. And we built artificial intelligence agents uh, that could audit these other side. Um, and we built um, another algorithm around them that allowed this co-evolution of the competition to um, occur. Um, and we could see the exact, see, see dynamics that were in the spirit or abstractly like the ones I just showed you on the previous page. So if you wanna know more, um, uh, this is uh, the sort of work that appears in AI and law conferences. Um, and I put here on the slide for you to go back, you can find one of our papers um, if you want to pursue more information about it. But another domain that I really care deeply about is cybersecurity. Um, and this domain covers computer networks and computer systems, um, the internet, um, all the places where the actors I represent, and you would presumably represent, all they wanna do is protect themselves or their assets or their perimeter of their environment uh, from the intentionally malicious behavior of um, attacking adversaries. You know, these are hackers and hackers are seeking to disrupt or steal or invade. Um, uh, people who are legitimately conducting their business on cyber infrastructure. So here's an example of that. Um, it's a uh, botnet attacks um, with the objective that the uh, actor who they target uh, will be unable to serve their legitimate clients. And, and that's called denial of service. And uh, the basic strategy of a botnet operator 
is to first compromise a very, very large set of internet resources, right? And turn them quote unquote into zombies. And it doesn't mean that these um, internet nodes are not working. They're actually continuing to function, but lurking within each one of them is a zombie program. Um, and when the botnet operator wants to launch an attack, these zombies are um, woken up by a command and control center um, and they proceed to use uh, numerous techniques to um, bombard the target through the internet and prevent the target because it's using all of its resources to serve them from legitimately um, serving their clients. And uh, there's no single botnet right now on the internet. When it started, there was two, one very, very large one that was quickly um, put, you know, um, pushed a little bit aside to make two. And over time, we have many, many small botnets in terms of how many zombies they have, right? Um, and they fix upon many targets and they attack with many techniques. Um, and you know, botnet operators actually sell their services. Um, and um, as a result, uh, when we build these defenses to stop them, they are driven by intelligent people in the back end. Um, and these, uh, essentially, these people um, adapt their botnets and they adapt the techniques that the botnets use. And um, so what does this look like? Well, here's a picture of it. Um, there's this dynamics of, you know, better techniques for attacking and then sufficient techniques to reactive techniques that handle that particular attack um, means, um, and then attack, defend, attack, defend, attack, defend. And that's what you're seeing here. So this is a graph where we, um, where, over, where, t where time is on the y-axis and on the x-axis axis is the sophistication of attacks and defenses. And if you follow that plot line, what's above that plot line um, is uh, progressively more sophisticated bot techniques. And below the technique, below the plot line are progressively more sophisticated defenses that have been invented and that are required to actually um, mitigate uh, or prevent these uh, botnet attacks. Um, so this is two human examples. I've shown you uh, taxation and I've shown you cyber security botnet attacks of this adversarial intelligence and adversarial dynamics that I'm so interested in occurring. Um, and clearly I want to model and simulate this to learn more about it. Um, but let's go to one more example that may not have been the first one you were thinking about either. So um, this is the adversarial intelligence and adversarial dynamics that can be found in nature and that is playing out even as we speak in nature. So we have competitive engagements continuously playing out in nature. In nature, they occur on a very long, like a biological time scale, not a technological split second time scale. Um, and as a result of these um, engagements and this background process of competitive evolution and co-evolution of attackers and defenders, what we see is these evolution of very powerful strategies that are defensive, right? So here's. Uh, natural examples of organisms that have co-evolved with the defensive goal of not being eaten um, and the, um, you know, and trying to thwart the offensive goal of an attacker. And so the skunk actually has this big white stripe and that prevents the attacker from coming close. And if the attacker makes the mistake of coming close, what does the skunk do? It has evolved this capacity to emit this, this horrible, horrible odor, right? Um, chameleons and cephalopods, that's the images here on the right, they've learned or adapted over time evolutionary to camouflage themselves from attackers. Um, and plants, they grow thorns or spikes to repel attackers, and some of them actually chemically induce bad taste or become toxic to their competitors. So fascinating defensive strategies have arisen in this same sort of notion of, of adversarial competition and evolution in nature. There's also uh, natural examples of populations evolving to, to, to attack better, right? Or to find mates better um, or to eat better, right? You know, we have the speed and the long teeth of cheetahs, um, the traits such as horns that have evolved from sexual selection, but they also um, contribute to the evolutionary adaptation and improvement of uh, and survival of different species. 
Uh, the most fascinating one I'm showing here is the one on the bottom left. So there's an attacker here, if you look really closely, and it is a crab spider. And it, that crab spider has masked itself by evolving to become the same color as the center of that flower. Uh, it's sitting here on a goldenrod and it's waiting and attacking by a camouflage because when the wasp comes, it can entrap the wasp. So what does my research do? It tries to connect this understanding of the evolution of biological adversarial intelligence um, and adaptation and dynamics to the adversarial competition and co-evolution we're seeing today in contemporary settings such as taxation and cybersecurity. And essentially, the research question I'm focusing on is, can I model natural coevolution um, in uh, to create these adversarial settings that in fact model natural settings, technological settings like cybersecurity and taxation, so that within my computational system, I have an example of artificial adversarial intelligence. And it's, it's sort of demonstrated by the dynamics that occur by the abstract connection of the agents and populations and dynamics I see um, and their validity in what we see in the real world. So my team to do that, we um, use algorithms that abstract competitive coevolutionary concepts. So that's where we're gonna turn halfway through the talk to a little bit more computer science and technical work, All right? Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about the algorithmic model of evolution and competitive co-evolution uh, that I can create um, and that will allow me to do this modeling and simulating of uh, adversarial intelligence um, and computationally it'll allow me to do it artificially, right? So uh, let's um, uh, talk about uh, two kinds of algorithms. First, a genetic algorithm that's going to model evolution of one population. And then we'll get into the more complex one of a competitive co-evolutionary genetic algorithm. Okay, but to do that, you have to actually step back. And um, what we did algorithmically, what the community has done, this is a vast community of researchers globally who are interested in evolutionary algorithms. I'm just one of them. Um, in the, the, the critical piece is to simplify and abstract the fundamentally important things about evolution and then translate them algorithmically, right? So here's a, here's, here's a simplification um, that tries to capture uh, the critical pieces here. There's some, it, when evolution occurs, there's a population um, and uh, individuals with, um, you know, we need to, we have sexual replication. Um, so a pair of um, individuals will find each other and mate. Um, and the number of um, offspring they have will be proportional to how fit they are relative to the other members of their population, right, of their species. Um, and this uh, replication is actually taking place on a genetic level. And in the genetic level, you know, an offspring has, has through genetic inheritance, the properties, the genetic properties uh, that are a mix or a combination or a crossover of their parents. Um, but the copying and the mixing is never uh, perfect. Um, and what we see is some random variation in the crossover and mixing of parents into an, into an offspring. Um, so this process of mating, um, having off, uh, uh, each offspring inheriting and being a mutation of the parents um, and uh, the number of offsprings being proportional to the fitness of the parents relative to all the uh, members of the population. That's sort of the fundamental sort of neo-Darwinian um, thesis, synthesis. Remember, uh, fitness is measured on the phenotype and uh, inheritance takes place at the gene level, right? So this behavior is a manifestation of the genes being developed into um, a behavior. So how do you take this sort of simplification of evolution, which has a lot of sophistication, even though we, we've managed to sort of isolate survival of the fittest, genetic inheritance, genetic mutation. Um, how, do you, how does one actually algorithmically um, uh, generate that? Well, we um, 
have an algorithmic process that aligns, but sort of simplifies some of these things. So a genetic algorithm, we in, inside our computer algorithm, we initialize a population that is some uh, set of agents or individuals. Um, and uh, we're able to essentially figure out how fit each of those individuals are. Um, and then we um, uh, uh, can then pick out individuals um, and uh, mate them by crossing over a representation we keep for them algorithmically of their genes um, so that two parents' genes can be mixed um, and then mutated to create a new offspring. And then we just simply have a loop that replaces the um, offspring into the population. And so the idea here is I can actually use this algorithm for optimization and search, right? I can take some set of solutions, initially random, I can test them all, um, and then I can draw out the better ones based on their performance. I can take their genetic representation that I have inside the computer, and I can mix them to create um, offspring with a little bit of mutation. And I can see whether those offspring are better or worse than their parents. And um, I can use that to replace the population and maintain this population um, as an adapt in an adaptive process through uh, selection based on fitness and, and inheritance. So um, it kind of feels like I'm telling you the same thing I told you on the other page and that's intentional. But what, you what I'm trying to show you through this flow chart is that we can sort of write an algorithm that has the precision of um, what computer programs have in terms of going step-by-step step and iterating and checking conditions, right? And leaving some of the other details out. So this is, this is an algorithm that allows me to evolve and adapt one population over time by applying some fitness criteria, applying my selection, my selection sub-algorithm um, and my uh, replication algorithm and replacement and iterating time and time again. But you know, in the competitive setting that I'm interested in, where there's two populations, I need to have an algorithm that's a little bit more complex than this. Um, and so for that, I actually use um, something called, it's a mouthful, a competitive co-evolutionary genetic algorithm. Um, and what this really is, is two different two different genetic algorithms that have been fused together, right? So what you have here is a, um, the top, on the top line in blue is a defensive genetic algorithm um, where we put the defensive population at the beginning on the left. It's gonna be evaluated for fitness in some way in this gray box. We'll select out parents who are better. We'll create offsprings through variation and we'll replace the um, parents with the offspring to create the next generation of defenders. Now below it, we have an attack genetic algorithm. It starts with an attack population. The attackers are evaluated. Uh, better attackers are selected. They're replicated uh, through inheritance and variation and the offspring replace the parent in the attack population. The way that these algorithms are fused is that when, I, when we need to decide whether a member of the defense is fit or to come up with a number that quantifies their fitness, and when we need to come up with a quantitative value for the fitness of an attacker, to get that, what we do is we build in here a simulation of the competitive environment. And we put the defender in the competitive environment. We put the attacker in the competitive environment and we let them compete, right? And when they compete, the algorithm has access to what happened and the outcome. And by using the outcome of that competition, that's some information about the fitness of the defender. And it's a piece of information that's about, that, that relates to the fitness of the attacker, right? And now I can see, keep that attacker in the ring. I can reinitialize the environment and I can grab a different defender. And that's what we're doing algorithmically. Algorithmically, what we're doing is we're taking different defenders and we're competing them against different attackers. And the fitness of a defender depends on how well it does on average or best or worst against all the attackers it's, it's competed against. And the fitness of an attacker depends on how it does on average or worst case or best case against all the defenders we've competed against. And that's how we get the fitness measure for these two different populations, individuals, by competing them. And that's what couples the two algorithms and that's what drives the coevolution here, right? And that's why this algorithm is so important to me because this algorithm is abstractly replicating that same stylistic process that I told you about, which also relates to those natural systems I told you about, right? We have defensive populations of um, 
of networks that are trying to defend against DDoS attacks, we have in reality attack populations of botnets, right? And what I'm doing is I'm simulating those botnet attacks against those defenders. And I'm allowing both those botnet attacks and those defenders to learn from their experience and create new strategies and new techniques through this selection and variation process and replacement process. Um, and that drives the, the uh, computational dynamics of oscillation or extinction or uh, uh, arms race adaptation that are related to the things I'm seeing in the real world. So let me tell you a little bit more, just a very, very high level, give you a high level brush of um, how you might, how, how, how we proceed to use these algorithms and actually embed them in a system. So the actual framework we built is called Rivals, as I mentioned before. Um, and the purpose of Rivals is to help network defenders anticipate attack strategies given some particular configuration they have of their network and to understand how much those attack strategies will actually impact the mission that they're trying to carry out on the network. So Rivals is really helping the defenders here by considering the arms races that could occur based on how the defender acts and how the attacker would act in response. So what Rivals is helping is to move away from this paradigm where uh, a system is attacked and then we react. Um, and then uh, the attacker gets smarter and we have to react again. Uh, and instead what Rivals is trying to do through modeling a simulation is to anticipate what would happen in one or more steps forward so that the defender can actually look at and think about how their moves will impact the moves of the attacker and perhaps come up with a strategy that's more resilient or robust over the longer term, right? Um, and it may also be that it, they will learn various attacks, you know, it'll allow them to see various attacks and to come up with various defensive tactics that they can more quickly release almost in anticipation of new attacks rather than waiting for those attacks to occur and analyzing them and then reacting. So that's what Rivals does. And we sort of have an engagement environment where we're going to model and simulate a network or some part of a network. And uh, we have attackers and we have defenders. And both of these are gonna go one at a time into the environment and we'll have a 1v1 engagement. Um, and we're going to use the results of that engagement to help both of these sides um, learn. So what we set up is modules. And in one module, we, um, uh, it performs the tactical adaptation and co-evolution of defenses and attacks. In another model, module, we simulate the environment where the two attackers will, the attacker and the defender will engage. Um, and what that involves us doing algorithmically is um, running a co-evolutionary algorithm and pulling out a defender and attacker, um, which in this case we call controllers, um, and sending one attack and one defense controller at a time over to this engagement environment. This engagement environment running um, the um, attack versus the defense. Um, and then the engagement environment sending back from this module uh, the outcomes. And these outcomes feed into the algorithms uh, to help um, compute the fitness of attacks and the fitnesses of, the fitnesses of defenses. Um, so let me give you uh, a, a, a concrete use case. Um, there's something called advanced persistent threats. This is when a um, state, usually state actors with very sophisticated practices, um, they decide to um, basically um, gather intelligence, ex use an exploit to gain entry into the system, establish a command and control connection between them and the infiltrated system. Then they want to, they escalate privileges that allow them to move around your system and then finally exfiltrate data or perhaps leave some other uh, messy stuff on your system. So this particular kill chain or these steps take place over long periods of time. And this is where you hear about things like, you know, we just discovered an attacker in our system and they've been there for months, right? Because the attacker gathered intelligence and moved in and they were so stealthy that they established this command and control and privilege escalation very, very quietly, very, very um, much in the background, it, you know, very, very hard to detect. Um, before this was um, the, the data exfiltration um, occurred. 
All right, so in these steps, I want to pay attention with rivals. We decide to pay attention to just one of these steps, and it's called conduct enterprise reconnaissance. And when you do that, the attacker has to decide what order with which they're going to move around the network very quietly, how many nodes they're going to look at in, one, in each batch, and how many total nodes they will look at um, in order to get the information they want but escape detection. And what we're going to use to describe the defense is a special um, overlay that you can run on software defined networks, which would take the original network and would actually create for each node on the network so that the attacker would be accessing this, um, a different view, a logical view of the network that in fact hides the true nodes inside a bigger network and allows fake nodes to go inside this network that can entrap it. But the thing is, there's a lot of design choices as to where to put these nodes and how to configure this network. And you don't know how to do it, and you really need to know how to do it in relation to what the attackers are doing in terms of their um, scanning. So that's what Rivals does. Rivals mm -hmm. looks at that dynamics. So what you can see when Rivals runs is this sort of oscillation of um, uh, who is actually um, in power. So when Rivals runs, initially the attackers are in power. Then when the defenders get smarter, the, the, the quality of the attackers goes down. Uh, but if we hold the defenders and we don't allow them to do anything and we allow the attackers to evolve, the attackers get better. But then when we allow the defenders to evolve, the attackers get weaker. So we're seeing in Rivals this particular sort of um, dynamics. And you can put Rivals, Rivals is enough that it, you know, this is just one example. There's many other examples that, two, a couple other examples that we've used the framework for to to generate this dynamics. So I'd like to acknowledge this student and uh, research scientist um, who did this work with me um, and present to you just very quickly flash by a number of publications because I know some of you are students and you might want to learn more. So you can go back to this page and find publications later. I'm um, gonna just recap, right? What are the takeaways? The takeaways are that coevolution is this very complex process, um, exists both in nature and society um, an adversarial intelligence really arises from the fact that we have intelligent agents co-evolving with each other. Um, and so if you can move that process into computation, you can understand much more about adversarial intelligence. And essentially what you have is you have a means of um, a route towards artificial adversarial intelligence. So with that, I know I've gone five minutes over and I apologize, my timer's a little off but um, I'd love to turn it over and hear how the audience is reacting and see if there's any questions for me. Um, thank you so much, Dr. O'Reilly. That was very, very interesting. And we have received some very interesting questions for you. Unfortunately, we don't have too much time because there are so many questions and we have to start with the next session too. But I think we have time for one question that we'd like to ask you. And I think it's been repeated uh, many times. So uh, the question says, uh, where do AI ethics factor in in the context of adversarial algorithms? Because this is such a burning topic at the moment right now. So uh, could you please shed some light on the same? Well, I consider my research extremely ethical. My research seeks to help um, defenders from attacks. Um, in doing so, though, I'm touching a very um, important piece, uh, which is understand what attackers do. So one has to be very careful with that information. Um, and uh, <laughs> with all cases, uh, we need to think about how this technology is put to use. Um, and so I'm using this uh, information to um, strengthen defenders. Wonderful. Um, Dr. O'Reilly, I'd just like to ask you one question that we uh, ask our speakers. What do you think is the importance of public engagement platforms in order for credible science to be communicated to the society? Uh, perhaps the example of India Science Festival or many more uh, platforms uh, such as this one. Uh, what do you think about the same? Well, today I told you about adversarial intelligence and I gave you these examples of taxation and cybersecurity. There's one more really important um, setting that we need to think about and it's disinformation. There are so many ways in which public platforms are being used to spread fraudulent information. And I consider that fraudulent information an attack and we need to learn how to defend ourselves against it. And one of the ways you can defend yourself against fraudulent information and disinformation is that you can educate yourself really well. 
And that is the merit of the India Science Fest. What it's doing is it's using public technology and it's spreading the word of science and it's spreading the word of fact and uh, um, ethical, moral values and principles brought to understanding how science reveals our, and improves our understanding of the world. And that to me is super important and that's why I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. That was so well put and it was so kind of you to share your thoughts with us. Dr. O'Reilly, on that note, uh, we have come to the end of your session. It was an absolute honor hosting you at India Science Festival. We hope to host you on our platform uh, once again and hopefully the event won't be virtual and you'll actually get to be here with us. I, I can't wait. I would love to come. Thank you so much. Uh, All right. Thank you for your time. Really yeah. appreciate it. Bye-bye. To all our attendees, thank you so much. Uh, we are very excited about the next session. And um, I think I must uh, not waste any more time and hand over uh, the mic to Professor Suresh Subramani, who has so graciously curated uh, this panel discussion on selected advances in modern biology. This panel is brought to us by uh, the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society. And Professor Subramani, we are so grateful to you for uh, doing this for us. Over to you, sir. Well, uh, thank you. How do I share the screen? How do I share the screen? This side. I thought you used it before. I haven't used it. Thank you. If our panelists would turn on their microphones as well as their videos, uh, we can get started. Uh, so I'll just give everyone a minute to uh, come online. Say hi, hello, Sonia. And, hello. Uh, I guess you have to be live. Um, hi, Sundar. Um, hi. We'll just give Vivek Malhotra a minute. And hi. I'm, I'm up. Can you hear oh, me? Okay. Yes. And can you hear yeah, me? I, yes, we, we can hear you. And uh, Amita uh, Segal, are you on? Yes, I am. Okay, very good. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all again to the second India Science Festival. Uh, TIGS is a sponsor of, of this event and I had the pleasure of uh, coming there and talking to a very a big audience uh, in Pune uh, in January of 2020. Uh, this year, the theme uh, for, for our panel discussion is selected advances in modern biology. Now there's so many exciting advances in modern biology. I could have chosen a thousand vignettes, but our time is limited. And I chose a set of experts here uh, uh, to who, who are passionate about their fields, who made significant contributions. And most importantly, their passion is infectious. So I hope you will get the sense that uh, th this is a group that will uh, excite you, stimulate you, and get you interested in science, and because that's the whole goal of the India Science Festival. So uh, without further ado, let me just introduce the panelists. Uh, we will have four panelists. The first one is Dr. Vivek Malhotra. He's a group leader at the Center for Genomic Regulation in Barcelona, Spain. He's one of the world's experts on protein trafficking and cellular compartmentalization, how subcellular organelles are formed and what they do. But today he will talk to us about controlling mucin levels, uh, mucin secretion in the lung airways and colon. Uh, and this is very important for cystic fibrosis and diseases like uh, colon cancer. After that, we will have Dr. Sonia Sen, who is a senior scientist at the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society. She's an expert on neurodevelopment and behavior, particularly working with insects. And she's got a very ambitious topic. In seven minutes, she's going to tell us how to build a brain. And luckily, it's a fly brain, not a human brain, but it'll be exciting all the same. Then we have uh, Dr. Amita Segal, who's a John Hermeser professor in the Department of Neuroscience at uh, UPenn. And she is one of the world's experts on circadian rhythm and sleep in fruit flies and mammals. And she will tell us everything you want to know about why organisms need sleep and what happens if your sleep cycle is disrupted um, and you have things like jet lag or, or uh, uh, disrupted sleep cycles. And finally, uh, to uh, end the session, we will have uh, Dr. Venkateshan Sundaresan, who's a distinguished professor from the Department of Plant Biology at UC Davis. He is a world expert on plant reproduction, particularly in rice, 
and he will talk to us about genome editing of crop plants to meet food needs uh, through clonal hybrids. So what I'm going to do is to have these panelists talk in this particular order. Uh, each one of them will talk for about five to seven minutes each. And I've basically asked them to try and address uh, you know, what their fields of biology is, what model is, what organisms do they work with, and why their particular model organism uh, allows them to address that particular problem in biology. But more broadly, they will tell you about their research, how they got interested in this topic, what are the most exciting advances, and uh, what the potential implications are. So it's a broad palette. I'll let each one of them um, excite you in their own way. So with that, uh, Vivek, I'd like to lead this off and have you start your presentation. Okay, but it says that I cannot start my video because the host has stopped it. No, we, we, we can... Uh, can you, you see my slides? Yeah, we can see your slide. And you hear me? Oh, all right, okay. Yes, yeah, okay. yeah, you're right. fine. Okay. So um, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, thank you, Suresh, for this wonderful opportunity. So I've been given five to seven minutes to present um, a, a topic that is of uh, great interest to me. And this is something that we've started working on for I'd say about five, six years ago. So this is one of the themes of my lab. And it has to do with how cells secrete mucins and how the quantities and the quality of mucins secreted is regulated. So human beings secrete um, a liter of mucins per day. That's a lot of mucins. And these mucins, when they are secreted by specialized cells that line all the way from your nose, your airway, lungs, uh, intestine, all the way to the very end, these specialized cells called the goblet cells, um, uh, release mucins, these are heavily glycosylated proteins. And when the mucins come out, they mix with uh, liquid and ions in the extracellular space and it becomes mucus. And this is something that you are probably all familiar with because this is something that comes out of your nose when you have a terrible cold or when you sneeze. Now, this is in fact, a very good thing to have. We secrete mucins, which become mucus. And uh, this provides the first layer of defense from foreign pathogens. So the lining of your airway and the intestine has a very thick layer of mucins, mucus. And its function is to basically only allow gases to go across. Everything else is prevented. And, and, and the mucin secreting cells as shown here in pink, they're usually surrounded by ciliary cells. So mucus comes out and, this, and, and anything that attaches to it, bacteria, viruses, pathogens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the movement of the cilia causes the mucin layer to move and it is uh, removed from um, the body in both directions, okay? Now, everyone knows about SARS virus. Um, and you know, one of the things that the viruses like the SARS do is they prevent mucin secretion. And this is something that we are trying to address, which makes them more infective, okay? Because now they can penetrate this barrier in the airway and in the intestine. Now you need to control the quantity secreted because if you secrete too much, you end up with problems uh, of the airway such as, uh, uh, as chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, asthma um, and, and, and um, uh, cystic fibrosis. And if you don't secrete, then in the intestine, you have problems of um, pathologies like the irritable bowel disease, Crohn's disease, colitis. And it turns out that there are these mucinous cancers. So for example, one of the, the issues that we are trying to address is patients with colorectal, mucinous colorectal cancer. So you have cancer cells that build a thick layer of mucus around them and those cells become chemo and immune refract, refractory, meaning they are basically now living in hiding. And these are the cells that become usually very, very, very aggressive. And in fact, one of my students who was a professor at Harvard, died at the age of 41 last year as a result of this mucinous uh, colorectal cancer. So the question is, how does a cell control how much mucin uh, is secreted at any given time? Um, and I'm going to give you an example here of um, how we can study these processes. So these are specialized goblet cells that are grown on tissue culture plates. And Usually there is some mucin secreted at, at, at all the time and it's called the basal stimulation. But when there is an agonist, which in our case, we just simply use ATP, it could be 
uh, cigarette smoke, it could be a pathogen. What happens is there is a burst of release. And in some cases, you can use very, very artificial conditions, which causes massive release of mucins. And I'm going to try to see if this uh, movie would work. So on uh, the slide, which says no stimulation, the bright particles that you see are many cells that are filled with these mucin granules, okay? Um, now, if I were to treat these cells, hit these cells with ATP on the left column, which you will see ATP, you see this material coming out, which is kind of light in color. And if you stimulate the cells with PMA or fovolester, this is what would happen if there was a pathogen attacking these cells, you would get a massive release. Okay? So the question is, how does a cell release just the right amount of mucins? And for the last four or five years, uh, we've been trying to address this issue by by identifying the genes or the breaking mechanism which controls this release propensity. And we have identified, and this is just to summarize uh, five or six years worth of work in, in, in one slide. So what we've done is we've used uh, these airway cells and cells of the colon and done a genome-wide screen to identify all the genes that are required for mucin secretion, production and secretion. So what we have found is a protein called KCHIP3 which is basically a potassium channel interacting protein number three, which is recruited to an, a granule that forms from the Golgi apparatus. So when the proteins are secreted, they're made in the endoplasmic reticulum, they go to the Golgi, where they get glycosylated from the Golgi, they are packed into specialized granules, which are first uh, given the name immature granules. These granules then mature by a very Inside the cell till a signal tells them to go and fuse to the surface and release their content. Well, it turns out that as long as these mature granules contain KCHIP3 on the surface, they cannot fuse. But if you remove it, then these granules go on to fuse. So this is basically the break. This is the traffic light. So you're quite familiar with uh, the traffic signals in India. You come to a traffic light, there is a red signal and you stop. Now, when the signal goes green, everyone rushes through, okay? And this is that signal, KCHIP3 is that signal that prevents granules from fusing. But the question here is, why do some granules contain KCHIP3 and why don't the others not? And this is something that we are trying to address. But for the time being, this KCHIP3 provides a great handle to understand and to address how cells control the amount of mucin secreted. And in the next slide, I just give you an example of the kind of observations that have allowed us to make this statement. So we can do all these experiments in tissue culture cells, but we've also created a mouse knockout in which the KCHIP3 gene has been deleted. So there is a mouse that does not have KCHIP3 gene. The mouse is fine, okay? But what we go and then do is to ask, what is the level of mucins? And in this case, we are looking in the colon of the mouse. The wild type normal mouse has this much mucin as shown in this black line here, okay? If you remove this KCHIP3, then look at the amount of mucin secreted. And we've calculated on average about two to three fold increase, but this is very, very difficult to quantitate because in some layers, some section, we see about a two fold increase, whereas in others, we see five to seven fold increase in the amounts of mucin secreted. Okay. So you can imagine now, if you have this much mucus present around the cells, nothing can penetrate. In fact, in these mice, we often see accumulation or presence of many, many different kinds of pathogens, which we can stain simply by using DNA dyes. We don't know the, the, the microbiome of, of these cells, of these tissue. This is something we are trying to do. But this is, in my opinion, the first understanding of how a protein, a 20 kilo Dalton, a small protein can control the propensity of the mucin granules um, in, in terms of their release propensity. And so this is something that is ongoing now. And what we have also done, I don't know how much time I have, what we've also done is we've taken cells from patients with colorectal cancer, okay? Um, and we know that these cells um, um, are refractory to standard chemotherapeutic agents, okay? What we can do is ordinarily, if you take a normal cell and if you were to add these uh, 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 chemotherapeutic agents, you kill them. 
But if we remove K-tube three, there is so much mucus secreted. There is a thick layer of mucus around these cells. And when you add those chemotherapeutic agents, they become uh, refractory, meaning they become ineffective. So we are trying to do now the opposite experiment, which is to find ways chemically. And again, I don't have the time for going into the details. We have done a screen of small molecules in collaboration with AstraZeneca, which allows us to inhibit this mucin secretion. And when we inhibit mucin secretion, when we then treat the same cells with chemotherapeutic agents, we can induce rapid killing of the cells. So I think this provides us not only an understanding of how cells control mucin secretion, but we also have the possibility of taking our studies to the next level and at least, at least address issues that have to do with hypermucin secretion uh, related issues. So I think this is all the time I've been allocated and this would be a right time to stop. And I would gladly answer any, any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll turn this over to Sonia Sen next. Uh, Vivek, if you would stop sharing your slides and Sonia can come on. Yeah, thank you. Sonia, you're on mute. Okay, can can you see my yeah. dark screen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, hello everyone. Hi Suresh, hi to the rest of the panelists and to the folks at the India Science uh, Festival. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to be at this fantastic forum. I, I hope that next year we'll be able to see it in person because uh, I, I remember for, from pictures of, of last year, it's, it's a very vibrant uh, forum. Okay, I will dive straight in and tell you about uh, what I promised. Oops, my slides are not moving. Uh, which is um, how to build a brain. Um, and this is because our lab basically works on trying to understand how nervous systems are put together during development. And once they're put together, how do they generate behavior? So what do I mean by this phrase, generate behavior? If you think about uh, the animal kingdom around you in your everyday life, we're surrounded by animals that do very interesting things to their environment. So for example, this female mosquito that bit me and I swatted it, or, or for example, these animals that make these nests to capture prey or to nurse their young. Animals around us really do very interesting things, which is what we want to understand. And, and it's because of nervous systems, the animal kingdom is the only, um, only set of organisms in the entire uh, tree of life that has, the, has a nervous system and therefore has the ability to respond to stimuli in the environment in very exquisite ways, such as these pictures that I'm showing you over here. So that's what we're interested in. How is this nervous system put together during development and how then does it generate all of these behaviors? So in the lab, we actually use the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster to be able to do this. And there are many reasons why, why we use the fly. And I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on, on, on why that is. So um, the first reason is that it's just simple to grow. You can basically take um, solidified porridge and, and put a few flies there and they'd be happy to grow in it. So they're quite cheap. Um, and then, you know, people have been studying flies for more than a hundred years now. And so that means that we have accumulated this wealth of knowledge and resources that we can use to, to ask the right questions. And, and this may surprise some of you, but a lot of the genes that flies have are shared with human beings. Um, the repertoire of genes is the same, although humans may have many more copies of those very same genes. So that, that's very important. If you want, want to understand the genetics of any even human biology, flies are a great place, place to start. And then, of course, because, we're, because of this you know, history of research with flies, we actually have developed a fantastic resource, an arsenal of tools to allow us to do fantastic experiments with flies. So we can turn on and off genes at will. 
uh, we can do it at different times. So we can do it in the larva, we can turn on and off genes in the adult, we can do it in specific tissues. So we can say, I want to turn on a gene in the brain, or I want to turn off a gene in the gonad, and you can do that with flies. And so that's really important for the questions related to development. But if you're interested in, in the nervous system from the perspective of behavior, you can do something else in flies with exquisite detail. You can turn on and off neurons at will. So you can go into the brain, turn on a set of genes, and then ask, what does it do to the behavior that I'm studying? Or you can turn off those neurons and ask the same questions. So really, a, a wealth of tools that you can use to design the, the perfect experiment to answer the question that you're interested in. And of course, all of this would not be much use if the fly didn't offer the biology uh, uh, related to the question that you're interested in. So we're, we're, we're talking about the nervous system. And so this is a question that I get prob probably asked the most amongst family and friends. Do flies have brains? And I want to tell you, yes, they do. They have very complex brains. So they're complex. The brains are complex in terms of numbers of neurons. So there are about 150,000 neurons in the fly. Uh, it's complex in terms of its organization, in terms of the connections that they make with each other. And as a re result of this complex brain, uh, flies exhibit wonderful behaviors. And you'll hear some of this in Amita's talk, talk next. Flies have the ability to show sleep, circadian biology. Flies show exquisite courtship behavior, as you can see in this top gap motion picture here. They show aggression. They, uh, uh, they fly. They can learn. They can form memories. So really, the nervous system is, is, is complex enough, yet not too complex. And it has the right set of behaviors to be able to ask interesting questions in. OK, so uh, let's just look at what we've learned about the brain from the fly. So here's a schematic of what the brain looks like. So that's the purple structure over there in the adult fly. You can see the adult fly in the gray, uh, in the gray over there. And, and, and that nervous system is made up. It, that's where all your 150,000 neurons are. And those neurons are made from neural stem cells. So here's a, here's a picture of two neural stem cells sitting in the brain of the fly, of the developing fly. And you can actually see these are, these are, these are, this, this is a real image. So here, here's the neural stem cell and it's budding off uh, a neuron. You can see it in action over here. And here's a video to show you the same. I'm sorry, I, I seem to have lost the reference there. This is not from our lab, but you can see this is during development, the neural stem cell is dividing and budding off these neurons so that at the end of larval life of the fly, you get many, many neural stem cells with clusters of neurons that they have generated sitting around them. And the brain is full, the developing brain is full of these neural stem cells. And now if you allow the fly to go, go through metamorphosis, that is through the uh, pupil life, then all of these neurons send out processes and find the right partners to make the right connections with. So now if you looked at these in, in the brain of the adult fly, some of these stem cells would have generated a bunch of neurons that looked like this. Other stem cells would have generated another set of neurons that looked like this. And a third stem cell would have made this set of neurons. So each one, each stem cell is making a different set of neurons. And this is what we've learned from the fly, that you have these modules of development. Stem cells seem to be setting their identity apart. They become different from one another and therefore generating different neurons. And so this is what we're interested in in my group. We want to understand how is one stem cell made different from another so that they can generate different neuron types? And um, you can see how this would be important because if you understood how a particular class of neurons were made, you would be able to make that neuron type at will. And I'm sure you're joining the dots here now because in, in the context of stem cell therapies, you want to be able to make neurons, the specific neurons that are lost or dead in the, in, in the scenario of disease or injury. You don't want to make any old neuron. You want to make that dopaminergic neuron that, that is no more, uh, that is depleted from the brain. And so we want to understand how specific neuron types are made so that we could reverse engineer them at will. So that's what half my lab works on. The other half works on behavior, trying to understand how this 
this brain now gives rise to behavior. And for this, actually, we don't use the fly. Well, not entirely. We still rely on the fly to test our ideas and get inspiration and, 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 and clues. But we actually study another related insect, the mosquito. So the mosquito belongs to the same family as flies. It's a dipteran. So its structure, in terms of structure of its nervous system, it's very similar. In terms of genes, it's very similar. So we, we use our knowledge from the fly to understand behavior in the mosquito. And the mosquito has exquisite behaviors, the most important of which for, for, for society is its blood feeding behavior. So not so there are there are very many species of mosquitoes in the world, and not all drink blood. Most most don't, in fact. And the ones that do, um, it's even in those the the male never drinks blood. It's only the female mosquito that drinks blood. And 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 mostly males and females usually will drink nectar or sap. And sometimes it's very only sometimes that only the female switches to taking a blood meal. So that's very interesting. Um, we know that the female does this largely because she needs to. She needs the blood to make eggs. And so here's here's the ovary of of a female mosquito. You can see this bunch of grape-like structure. Each one of these grapes in there is actually a single developing ovary, and that's what she needs the the blood meal for to to make it into a, a full mature egg. And so we want to understand how those circuits in the brain are driving this very important public health impactful behavior, right? What is, what is it, what is the circuitry that makes the mosquito, female mosquito, take that decision of, I don't want nectar anymore, I want to drink of blood. Um, okay, so, and, and, and you know how this will be important, right? Because if, if a female mosquito didn't drink blood, you, she couldn't carry diseases. Okay, so, so that's, that's the flavor of what our lab does. And with that, I will end and just show you the, the gang that, that does all of this work. You can read their names over there. Uh, and, and I will hand over the stage to, I guess, Amita. Um, and I'm looking forward to any questions and discussions in the later sessions. Thank you, Sonia. So if you would stop sharing your slides and uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Amita Segal. She's going to talk to us about sleep. Amita, you might still be on mute. Uh, Okay, I just wanted to get my slides lined up. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity. Thank you all for uh, tuning in and thank you, Suresh, for putting this together. Been enjoying the talks that have come before me. So what we work on is circadian rhythms. Um, and these are 24 hour rhythms of behavior and physiology that are seen in almost all living beings. So I think most people are aware that um, we sleep at a specific time of day, but sleep and wake are not the only aspects of uh, physiology that are under uh, this 24 hour control. Truth of the matter is that it's hard to find an aspect of physiology that doesn't on some level show what we call circadian regulation. So here on this slide is, are shown the different processes in humans that show um, differences across a 24 hour day. And um, so, you know, you'll notice that um, at some times of day, you're gonna have um, changes in blood pressure, melatonin, body temperature, um, sleep, of course, down here. And what I'd like to stress is that these are just a few of the processes that in humans uh, have a 24 hour component to them. So, <clears throat> Glucose is different at different times of day in our blood. Uh, insulin is different at different times of day. Cholesterol is different, okay? Our response to drugs is different. Cortisol is different. So almost everything in our bodies is changing over the course of a day-night cycle. So you might say, okay, fine, so this happens, but um, why should I care, you know? Let things go up and down as they do. And the reason you should care is because when rhythms are disrupted, 
of this internal pattern we have. And this can occur in different ways. So it could be intrinsic factors. There are people who actually don't have very uh, well-defined rhythms, uh, sleep-wake cycles and other rhythms because they have mutations in them. The other uh, scenario in which rhythms are disrupted is with aging. So you all may have noticed, um, you know, if you see older relatives um, that they are going to sleep at odd times, perhaps waking up in the middle of the night, perhaps napping more during the day, that is all a sign of these rhythmic patterns breaking down with age. But these rhythms can also break down with extrinsic factors. So if you do shift work, for instance, if you work at night instead of during the day, you'll find that um, you generally don't feel very well. And it's because your body rhythms are not in synchrony with the environment. Chronic jet lag. So if you travel to a different time zone, which many of you may have done, you'll notice that it takes a while to adjust to the new time zone. And while you're adjusting, again, your sleep patterns are off, your body functions are off, you know, your, your gastrointestinal functions are off, for instance. And then finally, if you eat at the wrong time of day, you also can have your rhythms disrupted. So if you eat really late at night, uh, again, you'll, the, your, your health is compromised. And when rhythms are disrupted by any of these uh, scenarios, there is an increased propensity towards neurological and psychiatric disease. So depression or neurodegenerative disorders, dementia. And there's also increased susceptibility to metabolic and cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes. So metabolic diseases in particular are very, very closely linked to circadian clocks because um, like I would mention to you, insulin, sugar, and, and glucose, everything is cycling in our bodies. So these rhythms that I've mentioned are controlled by clocks that are within us. And when I was a trainee at the time when I had um, just finished my PhD and I was looking to do my postdoctoral work, I became interested in this question of how these clocks are made within us. And the model that I chose to work with is the one that was just so beautifully introduced by Sonia, which is the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. And I don't have to tell you why flies are a great model to work with because Sonia has done that already. Very glad she went before me. Um, and so what in this case we used the fly for was to understand how a clock is generated. So I joined the lab of Michael Young, uh, who was at Rockefeller University in New York City. And he was using genetic approaches to understand how you make a clock within a fly. Because flies also have rhythms and they have you know, rest activity, very robust rest activity and other rhythms. Now, one of the reasons um, we were asked in these presentations to talk about how we were drawn to our field of interest and why we chose the approaches we did. And one of the reasons that I was drawn to this was because I had been interested in the genetic basis of behavior. Um, you know, what is it in our genes that makes us behave in a particular way? And it seemed to me that rest activity behavior um, which is a very, very robust, well-defined behavior, might be very tractable. And so it might lend itself better to genetic analysis than would a lot of other behaviors, such as learning and memory, for instance. And so this is how I came to be uh, in this lab. And we took genetic approaches to find genes that generate a circadian clock and then try to put you know, pieces together to figure out how those genes generate a clock. Now, this work I have to tell you at the time, um, this was you know, 25 years ago, um, was a field that was not very well recognized. Uh, a lot of people didn't know much about it. And um, so it was sort of a risky project to be working on. The good news is that, um, we actually were able to make advances. So I contributed to our understanding of 
how clocks are generated. And 25 years later, or almost 25 years later, it led to the Nobel Prize for my postdoctoral mentor, Michael Young, shown here. So he shared the prize with the heads of two other labs, Michael Rospash and, and Jeff Hall, who had also made contributions to understanding how a clock is generated. And I'm sharing this story with you trainees because I, there's a lesson here. So I, I actually, um, so I was invited to Stockholm because I had contributed to this work. And um, I would found to my surprise and shock that the poster put out by the Nobel Assembly showed, you know, how the earth is rotating. So therefore we have clocks because we are adapting to this uh, daily cyclic environment we live in and then you know how you generate a clock and then my data were right here in the middle of this poster and I have to tell you that when I generated these data I did not believe them okay when we all in science tend to doubt what we do all right you because you're doing it for the first time right nobody else has done this before so so you doubt it and in particular if you're in a field where nothing or not much has been done before, there's no framework. So it's, it's a real time of self doubt. And um, I also felt like I had, I mean, in fact, it's true. I had very bad hands, so I never generated, you know, pretty data. And so that made me question it all the more. And, and lo and behold, 25 years later, this is where my data are. And so this is a lesson to all of you who might go into science is, um, you never know when what you do today is going to be important tomorrow or 25 years from now. So, so this is the story of how you get clocks. Now, along the way, my lab has also become interested in one of the behaviors controlled by clocks, and that is in sleep. So I mentioned that sleep-wake is the best known um, rhythm controlled by clocks. But sleep, of course, is an entity worth studying in its own right. You know, like, why do we sleep? Why do we spend one third of our lives in this state that is so non-productive? And we absolutely have to do it because when you don't sleep, a lot of bad things happen, okay? Now this is sleep independent of its timing, okay? Yeah, sleep has a 24 hour rhythm, but that doesn't answer the question of, you know, why do we sleep? And those kinds of questions come from sleep depriving people and asking how are they compromised? And when people are sleep deprived, they show a lot of deficits in um, behavior, in, in learning and memory, in immune function, in metabolic function, in cardiac function. And so some years ago, we asked, you know, we managed to use the fruit fly to figure out how clocks are generated. Can we use the fly now to ask why we sleep and what makes us sleepy? So you may have noticed that I kept referring to the fly rest activity cycle because 20 years ago, we did not know if rest in flies was sleep, you know, they rest, but are they actually sleeping? And so we put some effort into this, showed that fly rest is a sleep-like state. And we now are using the fly um, to understand how sleepiness occurs, why we sleep. And for both our circadian work and our sleep work, we are also now starting to translate this to mammalian models, um, including humans. And I will stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Amita. And I hope that uh, given the late hour for people in India, while Venkar is putting up his slides, I hope that's woken you up and excited you enough to keep you awake uh, all through the night. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sundar, uh, I'll transfer this over to you then. Thanks, Suresh, um, and for inviting me to this great symposium. And um, so I'm at the University of California, Davis on the West Coast. And the previous speaker, Professor Sager, gave an excellent excuse for me to, for this being very early in the morning. How now I understand why I feel the way I do now. So hopefully I'm still coherent enough that you can 
understand me despite my disrupted circadian rhythm and sleep. Um, so we work on self-cloning plants by genome editing. That's that was my talk. But we, my our research really started with a very basic biology question: How does life begin for a plant? So life begins in plants in a sense the same as in animals. You have a sperm cell and you have an egg cell. The sper sperm is within the pollen. The egg is within the ovule, and they and they fuse. They this process is called fertilization, and sperm plus egg gives you a cell called a zygote. Now this zygote is a special cell in that it now is able to undergo cell divisions and make an embryo within a seed. And furthermore, the seed then gives rise to a, the next generation of the plant. So everything that is here really began in these stages. And especially with this one cell that went on to make a whole organism. So it's a very special cell and we were in, got very interested in this and what makes it special. How we looked at, uh, we did something called RNA sequencing where we looked at the RNA produced by the cell. In the process, we found that there's a gene called baby, baby boom one, BBM one. This gene is active in the zygote. Then that's great. It's also strangely act on in the sperm and off in the egg. And, it, and it's a regulatory gene. That means it's a type of gene called transcription factor, which controls other genes. Like these are often molecular switches in the genome. So here again, here's the egg cell. And these are sperm cells within the pollen. They're green because we are able to label the BBM1 protein, uh, the baby boom protein with a, a green fluorescent uh, molecule and now egg plus sperm gives zygote and that also has BBM and of course this zygote then goes on to divide and make an embryo in the seed. So our, we speculated that BBM which is uh, on in the zygote and in the sperm cell might be what the egg cell needs as a jump start to make to go through this whole program. Remember the egg is what does most of the work. The sperm cells are tiny. And, and this much of the zygote is really derived from the egg cell. Okay, so then the question is, if that BBM1 is so important, that's what the sperm cell is bringing over, then if we could switch on BBM1 before it's fertilized, then can you bypass the sperm cell and just go on to make an embryo without fertilization? And the answer, in short, in one word is yes. And here's how it happens. So here, here's your egg cell. We introduced a transgene that by which uh, BBM is expressed, it's in that egg cell, and we got an embryo. And this embryo was without fertilization. So it then went on to develop, to make a plant. And this, is, this process is called parthenogenesis. So you got an embryo without fertilization by the sperm cell, the egg cell on its own was able to do this. You can also think of this as virgin birth in plants. Okay, so now switching on this one factor in, is, in the egg cell is sufficient to bypass fertilization. And this egg cell makes haploid progeny. That means haploid means one set of chromosomes. Here's an example of a haploid rice plant that we produced using this method, and it, it has only one set of chromosomes. Why is that? Because a process called meiosis ensures that every egg cell inherits half the chromosomes of the parent. This is true in plants, it's true in animals and in humans, that egg cells have half the chromosomes, and so do sperm cells have only half the chromosomes. But then the question is, what would happen if you knocked out meiosis? Then the egg cell would inherit all of the parental chromosomes, right? And now if this egg cell could undergo parthenogenesis, you'd get clones. That is, you'd get progeny that are genetically identical to the parent. So how do you knock out meiosis? Well, fortunately, uh, two collaborat 
perhaps uh, Mercier and Guadagnoni in France had found that mutation of three meiotic genes, which they called MIME, eliminates meiosis. So that's what we did. We uh, took this result and edited the rice genome for these three genes to block meiosis. If you do that, the result is deployed egg cells. So now instead of being half the number of chromosomes, these special egg cells have the full set of parental chromosomes. And here there's a schematic showing what we did. Here's the rice plant. We, we use genome editing to eliminate meiosis. That means you get a deployed egg cell. And now we then triggered parthenogenesis by using BBM1 to make an embryo, to make a zygote, which then made an embryo and then made a whole a plant. And these plants, because you, they're derived from egg cells that have the entire set of parental chromosomes, the, these progeny are genetically identical to the parent, they're clones. And we've been able to do this for successive generations. So we took the clones made clones out of those by and then further clones for eight consecutive times so that we now have the eighth generation uh, which have so the last sexual parent was eight generations ago and this is the eighth descendant clone so this process is called uh, the synthetic apomixis and it's published in this paper that you can look up if you want to know more details okay so now i come to the application let's start with something called the hybrid revolution in agriculture. Here is a graph of maize or corn yields in the United States from the last century and a half. So for, from about half a century here, the yield, which is on the y-axis, was pretty much steady, flat. This is before hybrid maize. Once hybrid maize was introduced, see what happens. It goes up and up and up, four times, five times the yield that you had before. So all of this was done with hybrids, hybrid corn. Uh, here's what's the situation with rice though, is that most rice farmers don't grow hybrid rice. It's about five to 10% in India and 0%, close to zero in Africa. This is all the rice growing regions in the world. And, and yet, if you look at global rice production, we are going to need a lot more rice uh, to feed a growing population and we, and uh, to meet those needs, we'll need 20% more rice by the year 2035. So here's the amount of deficit that is being shown here. That's what we need to meet. And without using more land, this can be met by just growing hybrid rice. So why don't we grow hybrid rice now? And the reason is that hybrid seed production is labor intensive. That makes hybrid seeds for most crops, including rice, too costly for poor farmers. Why is it labor intensive? That's because to make hybrids, you have to cross the parental, two parental lines that make the hybrid. And the hybrid is much more vigorous than either of the parents. Well, that's great, but now you take the seeds of the hybrids and plant them, what you find is that the progeny of the hybrids are not as good as the, as the hybrid itself. So you get segregation, which means you get all sorts of sizes and shapes. And this is no good for high yields. You lose that hybrid vigor in the progeny. So what? We, so it's this process of crossing. So you, you can't just plant the seeds. You have to go back and recross these lines, which has to be done through labor intensive methods. That's what makes hybrids costly. Now, instead of doing this, if you could just take the seeds from the hybrids and make them be as good as the hybrids, that would solve the problem. That's what we repeated through our method of, that is we made clones, uh, a method to make clones of the hybrids so that the progeny have the same genetic constitution as the parent, the same high yields. So this clonal hybrids produced by genome editing will allow farmers to produce their own hybrid seeds inexpensively, and they simply replant seeds that they've harvested. So that's very cheap compared to buying say, seeds every year. And this has been subject of much discussion since the work was published. And here's from the 
something from the World Economic Forum, which you can read. It's an uh, issue of January 2019, which uh, describes the po potential impact of this technology. And also, if you want a more scientific insight, uh, science-based insight, there was an article in Nature Biotech, uh, February 2019, that also discusses the same thing. And uh, I thank you for your attention, and I'll end here. Okay, terrific. Uh, thank you so much, Sundar. Very exciting and a lot of potential. So I'd like now to engage in a panel discussion where I'm going to throw out a set of questions, but I'd like invite the panelists to also talk to each other and raise questions that you might have. And just to get the thing started, um, let me uh, just ask each one of you, you know, so Amita gave a wonderful presentation about how uh, she picked a problem that she was not really sure that this was going to be significant or important. But then, you know, curiosity and great experiments led to the fact that this ultimately resulted uh, in a Nobel Prize for the people doing the work. And every one of us uh, has similar examples. So how do you pick a problem? And in particular, what gives you the courage and the persistence to stay with a problem working on it for 20, 25 years? Because Sometimes, you know, science can be frustrating. You go through periods where there's no results and then suddenly there's something that's very exciting uh, for the entire uh, planet. So let's talk a little bit about that. I'm going to start with Amita, so, uh, but please feel free to chip in and anyone can answer these questions. So, so Amita, just talk a little bit more about your work and I, I, when you got started with it and you know, how did you, when did you realize that this was going to be conserved in, in uh, other systems other than flies? And uh, when did you get really, uh, when did it hit you that this is really a terribly important problem? Yeah, so these things, as you mentioned, you know, happen gradually, slowly in science. So at any given time, you know, you may not know uh, whether what you're working on is going to be relevant or not. Um, I should say, you know, that as a, as a trainee starting out, there is a temptation to jump on the bandwagon of the latest, hottest thing out there. And I kind of caution trainees against doing that because um, the importance of your contribution, you know, will be perhaps uh, less in that type of area where already a lot is known and it's, you know, become mainstream than one that is just developing. But it is, it's hard. Um, you take that chance and you, you know, wait for things to happen. In my case, um, you know, I finished my postdoc as in I went to look for a faculty position and I actually looked for a faculty position before the bulk of my postdoc work was published, in part because I was tired of being a postdoc, in part, and again, this speaks to the self-doubt, I thought to myself, you know what, I should find a job before everybody finds out that this whole thing is not real. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I swear that was like, you know, going through my mind. And it wasn't until I, you know, a year after my postdoc, we published the work and things suddenly in this field started picking up. And then Three or four years later, we realized that it's all conserved in mammals. And a couple of years after that, human genes that were mutated and leading to circadian disorders in, in uh, humans came along. Um, so in, in this case, it panned out. There will be times when you start something and it doesn't quite pan out and you have to use your judgment. I think the most important thing is that you be passionate about what you're doing. And as long as that is the case, um, you know, going into something that's new, you know, the potential for impact is going to be much greater. Well, thank you. Let me turn to Vivek uh, because uh, he also worked in a lab uh, in a field uh, in protein secretion, which was very, very complex. It was not clear that one would get to a molecular understanding. And he was one of the pioneers in Jim Rothman's lab to crack that particular problem of how proteins are packaged into vesicles and transported from one compartment to the other inside the cell. So Vivek, tell us a little bit about uh, the challenges you might have faced. Were you confident, uh, I bet you were, uh, that this would uh, solve itself uh, and this was an important problem? Uh, you have, your microphone is off. 
I, I've, I've always been very confident, but I wouldn't say that uh, I fared well. You know very well that I had to try two times to get my position at UCSD in your department as a faculty. So when I finished my postdoc <laughs> at Stanford, um, you know, people said, yeah, so we, uh, we will understand how proteins are secreted. And, and, and it has is, it is been a challenge. And I, the only advice I have for the young ones since I'm not so young anymore, <clears throat> is that, you know, look, work on something that hasn't been beaten to death, you know, um, and don't follow fashions. You know, there was a time when, you know, micro RNAs were very fashionable. Then, you know, everyone was into stem cells. Then everyone got into the neurodegeneration. And now everyone is into these liquid condensates. You know, what happens is when a topic becomes very fashionable, there's a lot of stuff that is done in a rush and it is not necessarily of the highest quality or doesn't really move the field forward. It's just filling in the gaps. So the best is work on something that you really think about all the time. And how you do that, I don't know. It's just like someone who is interested in being a cricket player is not going to wake up one morning and say, oh, you know what, I'd like to have a go at tennis. I think it is coming from you. It has to come from you and your discussions with your colleagues and your neighbors and, and, and looking up to a few, few people that you admire. Um, I remember when I joined Jim Rothman's lab at, in 1985, 86, we had not a single protein identified in the secretory pathway. And Pallotti had basically laid out the pathway in 1974. And when Jim and Randy and Tom Sudoff got the Nobel Prize in, 19, in 2013, I was also at Stockholm. And I remember these three legends were saying, everything is done. We know everything. And in fact, I completely disagree. I think we have nuts and bolts of the processes, but there are huge gaps. And this is always going to be true in science. So it's never complete. Thales said that 2000 years before Christ, that life science will never be complete, accurate, or permanent. So if you follow that motto, and you believe that the currency of science is or our data, then you keep at it. Keep generating original data and hope that people catch on to it. It takes usually, a good paper takes about five years before its value is appreciated. And if you catch the attention by producing something unique that is different, then you will promote the field. And I think this has been my motto. And, and I still think that we're using the same thing. You know, 15, 20 years ago, in our field, we used to talk about hey, how are collagens secreted? How are mucin secreted? Amita mentioned this business of mel melatonin being secreted in a circadian manner. In fact, collagens are secreted in a circadian manner. And some of the genes that we identify show circadian uh, day-night expression patterns. Who would have thought? I would still yeah. like to know what happens when you sleep, you start secreting certain chemokines and cytokines. How does that system work? I was jotting down on a piece of paper when Amita was describing her findings. So I think this is just internal. It's like a clock, it keeps you going. And this has been my, 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 my way of being. And that is you take a problem that is not very well understood and you get into it. Surround yourself by very smart people. Think of yourself as the lowest in the, on the ladder and look up rather than looking down and keep at it. I can assure you in terms of the passion that uh, our panelists show, the persistence about working on a problem does not undergo any kind of circadian rhythm. They're thinking about their problems 24 seven. Sonia, yes. you're younger in your career, uh, getting launched off. Uh, what excites you the most? And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, this thought about, uh, you know, uh, finding a problem that excites you and uh, uh, how you go about uh, following that course. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so I guess uh, uh, my take on this is that uh, uh, it's a, it, one needs to follow, uh, tread a fine line between persistence and, and, uh, and, so, so between between persistence, knowing when you know you have to stay stay with it to finish 
finish the job you've started and then knowing, uh, listening to yourself and knowing when you've lost interest in something. So I think both of those things. So for me, if I wake up in the morning and I'm thinking about that problem, I know that that's a good problem to work on. I guess that's what I've done. And, and, and sometimes, sometimes when you realize that, okay, this, I'm, I'm getting tired of this, you have, to, you have to know when to stop, but also know when you need to complete that job and then move on. So both of those things. Yeah. Uh, Sundar, you have any comments to add, uh, particularly the, this transition with a clonal hybrid is very exciting science, but you know, you, I guess the, this came uh, more recently and it's really revolutionary breakthroughs. Tell us a little bit more about it. <clears throat> well, I, I don't have much to add to what the other panelists said in terms of, I, th I think they all made excellent points. And that's uh, uh, all, uh, the one, one thing I can add is that when we started this project, it was not an applied science problem. It was basic science. We just wanted to understand how does an egg cell become a zygote? Mm -hmm. And there are other people trying to solve this problem more directly of clonal hybrids just by you know, more directed way. And for over 20 years, I would say that did. And the solution came not through, oddly enough, not through directly approaching the problem, but through in, and indirectly through insights gained from basic science. So even if you're in, so I guess my message would be, even if you're interested in applications or, down the, or the impact of your work, don't neglect the basic science. That's what can ultimately get you there. Yeah. So I'm going to, uh, we are running low on time, but I do want to address one other thought, and this is aimed mostly at the listeners. So most of us were trained in very traditional sciences, you know, meaning biology has always, for a long time, has been a descriptive science where you just describe phenomena. Uh, and it is only more recently that it's moving in the direction of a more quantitative, more predictive uh, science. So in terms of training or teaching, you know, can you talk a little bit about how each one of you has moved from your traditional field to learn other things, whether it's informatics or, or uh, 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 technological improvements in, uh, in instrumentation? Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about that aspect to see where is biology headed and what would you recommend that a student doing biology today, should they just focus on botany or zoology or some, something like that? Or do they need to have a broad interdisciplinary training to, order to crack a particular problem? Uh, and I, uh, anyone can start really. Uh, uh, Sundar, you can I, start. Uh, perhaps, or Amita, go ahead. Yeah, please. I, I just wanted to say very quickly that, um, yes, some biology has become very quantitative. Uh, much of it, I must admit, I'm not terribly happy about. I like to see things that are qualitatively different and not always quantify, but quantification is where it's at. You know, everything is digitized now. And my one piece of advice would be to students, take math and stick with it. One of the big mistakes I made during my training in mm -hmm. India was I was allowed to leave math pretty early in my training and I did it and I regret it every single day. Others, uh, uh, can, I, can, I, can I just add something too? So I was I was trained as a biochemist, both as an undergraduate and um, when I was at Oxford. And I, even at Stanford, I was basically a biochemist. And then we were the first ones to do one of the first genome-wide screens in Drosophila. And we are now dealing with patients uh, with clinical uh, features of um, asthma and, and, and mucinous cancers and fiber, tissue fibrosis. So I think one of the key features of the next generation of scientists has to be interdisciplinarity. I think you have to be fluent in many, many areas of biology or, or sciences. I think it's going to turn out that, you know, we will have all the molecules that are functioning in a cell in the next 10 years or so. We will then be able to sort of, hopefully we'll get to the physics of, of the biological processes, which cannot always be simply explained in terms of molecules, but it will have to be in terms of forces, pressure, density, volume, viscosity. Um, and, and Amita said that you have to be a, a fluent in mathematics, which is very true. And unfortunately, I'm a complete zero, but I've surrounded myself with people who are very, very smart. 
So you need to understand bioinformatics so that you can now do gene building. You can build genes and ask, here is a protein, and I would like to find if this protein is, is, is present in bacteria as well. Well, it may not be a, a structural ortholog, but it might be a functional ortholog. And you need to be able to decipher that kind of information. You have to have a mindset that allows you to see beyond just the little area, whether it's molecular biology or it's, it's, it's cell biology or imaging. So don't be a one trick pony. You cannot go very far with that because science is changing at an amazing speed. So this is, this is, this is my little pennies worth um, to the young ones. Before I turn it to, over to uh, uh, the others to comment, I'll just say that uh, all of us, uh, including myself and the panelists, have surrounded ourselves with people more brilliant than we are, because that is the way to success. And in fact, we uh, readily go and interact with people, talk about issues, and are happy to get ideas and input from other people. So this is, in con anyone who thinks they have a brilliant idea and doesn't want to share it with the rest of the world, uh, is likely to fail because uh, you know they uh, they don't get the benefit of input from from the rest of the society and their colleagues. And you can certainly learn new fields and disciplines uh, by having colleagues teach that to you. So Sundar or Sonia, do you want to quickly comment on on this topic? Uh, Sundar, please go ahead. Oh no, <coughs> sorry. Um, I'm a bit sluggish here, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, no, I, I think absolutely you need to have uh, multiple strengths now to survive in biology today and uh, to do well and uh, again, a, a grasp of computational tools is really important for, for anything that you do, at least in the general areas of genomics and gene editing and, and even beyond that neurosciences, I think you can't avoid those things. You don't have to be an expert in math, but you just need to know how to use the tools of math. Yeah. And that, that to me is a critical thing. And I came, I was a physics major. In fact, I started my PhD in physics before I switched. So, and what I found was that you couldn't directly model biological systems the way that I'd hoped you could, because biology is just too complicated. So. Mm -hmm. They don't, it doesn't seem to follow any rules. So, <laughs> and, uh, but you can still do interesting work without, uh, you know, by using, by a judicious use of computational tools. And, it, and you can't avoid that now. Yeah. You have to do it. That's, Sonia, so did you uh, wrap up uh, this thing with your final thoughts on this? I don't think I can add anything more. I'll, I'll just say that I agree with uh, with all the other panelists, and maybe just just say that don't to, to the to the students out there don't get don't get put off or overwhelmed by this. You know, computational, 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 math, math, math. If you if you're interested in a problem, I guess you'll follow it through, and you'll you'll meet with, collaborate with all the right people who will be able to help you do the things that you that you want to do. So we all have our strengths and 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 we work with the people who complement our strengths. Yeah, so Sonia, I think you put it very aptly that is you follow the problem and if the problem is interesting, you will acquire all the tools from various disciplines to tackle that particular problem. And that's what keeps you going in this. So I know the time is short uh, and it's late for the people in India. So I want to thank all of you for a very exciting session. It's a, uh, a la carte menu on modern uh, uh, biology, but I hope it has piqued your interest and uh, you can go uh, look at their websites. And thank you again to the audience. And uh, Shruti, I want to hand this back over to you uh, for uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to this group. Thank you so much, Professor. On behalf of the entire team at ISF, I thank you all for being a part of this panel discussion. Dr. Sain, Dr. Malhotra, Professor Segal, and Professor Sundaresan, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on our pl platform. This discussion was really enriching, and I'm sure so many of our attendees have, have really been inspired by the things that you had to say. 
Professor Subramani, thank you so much for curating and moderating this discussion. As always, it was a pleasure to have you. And uh, we're very grateful to you for everything that you've done. And of course, TIG is our program partner, one of our sponsors. Very, very happy. And we, we do hope that this collaboration um, fosters ahead very well. Thank you for being a part of our journey of revolutionizing the ecosystem in India to bring science and society closer together. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night and thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you and good night. Bye-bye. Thank you, good night. Cheers, bye. To all our attendees, thank you so much for sticking around. It's been a long day. We've had some really interesting conversations with all our speakers and panelists. You have all been uh, you know, very patient with all of us. We had some very, very interesting talks from space, health, uh, biology, uh, in AI, in hacking. And it was definitely a very enriching evening. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, now, uh, I know that I've told you all this before, but I'll still repeat myself. We have a lot of events throughout the entire month of January. So stay tuned. You can head over to our website and see all the uh, events that we have planned for the rest of the month. All our events are free to attend. You don't have to pay anything to uh, be a part of this festival. So make sure that you head over to our website and uh, register for whatever event appeals to you the most. And um, keep celebrating science with us because, um, you know, we're here to bring the voice of science closer to all of you. Thank you so much. Have a great night. And I'll see you tomorrow for our uh, set of events um, that are lined up in the morning as well as, our, as well as the evening. So make sure that you sign up for those. Thank you so much. Good night.